It's really difficult to make something new. Even if you have the drive to see your vision through to completion, taking that first step over the precipice and into the unknown requires serious courage. Sitting here now as I edit this video, I can't help but wonder if Futatsugi Yukio and the folks at Team Andromeda felt this very same creative anxiety when they came together in the 90s to begin work on Panzer Dragoon. to pick between creating a racing or a shooting game to showcase the upcoming Sega Saturn, Futatsugi originally sought to make a racing game. But when System Seicom revealed Gale Racer, a Saturn port of the arcade game Radmobile, Futatsuki's decision was effectively made for him. The early internal hype around AM2's Virtua Fighter and its advanced 3D animation led Futatsuki to develop a concept that contrasted the typical focus on mech and machinery in sci-fi shooting games against organic objects and creatures that could show off more lifelike animated qualities. In his own words, if I could ride anything, what would I choose to ride? A dragon, of course. This sense of boyish wonder really encapsulates the creative drive that underpins Panzer Dragoon's development. Futatsugi was given the Herculean task of helping shepherd Sega into the future in the midst of a bloody and rapidly escalating console war. That war defined three generations of consoles throughout the 90s, and would go on to change the shape of the industry and technology forever. It's hard not to see the context surrounding Panzer Dragoon as heavily influencing its development. As the series would grow, and as the stakes would get larger with each and every one of Sega's losing battles mounting against them, the writing on the wall would become harder and harder to ignore. As such, the Panzer Dragoon series is a very interesting lens with which to examine Sega's failures in the hardware market, as well as the ambitions of the creatives that bled to drag the company to its inevitable exit from the console war as the future they dreamed of never came to be. Strong art direction was a key focus for Team Andromeda early in development as they drew from a distinctly flavorful mix of Japanese manga and French indie comic art for the game's visual design. Panzer Dragoon's world is filled with strange creatures and landscapes that look like they could be taken from a René Leloup film, with supplemental influence from Studio Ghibli's Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind and the dying earth genre pioneered by Jack Vance. Legendary French comics artist Sean Giraud, also known as Mobius, would be a direct influence on and contributor to the series, providing some key artwork for the game and designing its Japanese cover art. It's a game made by niche art nerds with avant-garde taste, and it shows. Its aesthetics at every opportunity take strange and idiosyncratic turns, partially driven by the Saturn hardware itself. The combination of 2D tiling and early 3D, especially using the Saturn's quad-based polygonal rendering, gives the Saturn trilogy a very unique look. The 3D marketing renders have a strange, ethereal quality to them befitting something you'd find in the back of a magazine you stole from your older cousin who, in a dereliction of babysitting duty, told you to find something to do and not cause any trouble so she could sneak outside to smoke weed with her friends. Futatsugi cites Namco's Starblade as an early pioneer in the cinematic shooter space, and as a major influence on the gameplay design in Panzer Dragoon. It's easy to see the links between the two, even beyond Starblade's position as a nearly genre-defining 3D shooter. An eerie atmosphere and a focus on a quietly told sci-fi narrative, where forward progression is unending and constant. Now, we need to address the elephant in the room. Or, should I say, the fox. Looking at Panzer Dragoon, it's hard not to immediately draw comparisons to Nintendo's 1993 Super Nintendo hit, Star Fox. They're both rail shooters, they both involve a focus on fantasy creatures and high-octane action, and both were trailblazers in home console 3D. Now, I'm a furry. Star Fox is in my cultural DNA, so I'd be remiss if I didn't give credit where it was due. 
but I think these games are actually a lot more different than they seem at first glance. Separate evolutions on the same genealogical tree leading back to Starblade. Where Star Fox took this space shooter template and tried to give it life through the cut and radio chatter of its lovingly rendered furry cast two years prior on the Super Nintendo, Panzer Dragoon was much more focused on the tangible reality of life. Futatsuki and his team put an emphasis on the creatures, the world and its nature, and the atmosphere of isolation that comes from being a traveler in a setting that is far vaster and more mysterious than we could ever truly know. Even the autonomous weaponry in Panzer Dragoon is technically alive. In the world of Panzer Dragoon, the beauty of life is not solely found in good deeds or the power of friendship. Life is a hostile and dangerous thing. To me, this is one of Panzer Dragoon's most key features, isolation. In one way or another, every game in this series circles a drain on this deeply melancholic feeling of being alone with great purpose. It's a series of games about people isolated by the divine missions they must undertake and the world-altering destruction they inevitably herald. Nonetheless, despite Panzer Dragoon's visible contrasts with Nintendo's own Star Fox, it wasn't Nintendo that Sega was fighting at the time. The console war was a war on multiple fronts, and the largest enemy on the horizon was not Nintendo, but Sony. In an interview with Kotaku in 2019, Futatsugi told interviewer Chris Kohler that, during the lead-up to the PlayStation's launch, he and programmer Suto Junichi posed as unaffiliated game devs and snuck into a Sony press event to scope the competition. There, they saw footage of the first Ridge Racer and were floored by the port. Describing the event, he told Kohler, There was a clear difference in the number of polygons. It just seemed like they took the arcade version and got it running on the PS1. Little did Futatsuki know at the time, it was Sega's own Virtua Fighter that motivated Sony to prioritize 3D in the first place. When people talk of the console war, Typically the bitter rivalry between the Sega Genesis, or Mega Drive if you're freaky, and the Super Nintendo comes to mind. In reality, this was just one stage of a much longer conflict that lasted three generations until Sega exited the market entirely after the failure of the Dreamcast. Technology was moving fast, and scrappy teams were churning out experimental titles on much shorter dev cycles than we're used to today. The rapid advancement of 3D technology mixing with the freeform nature of haphazard development gave us some of the most interesting and innovative games ever made over the course of an extremely small period of time. Knowing the Saturn's precarious market position as the PlayStation loomed on the horizon, Futatsuki sought to innovate in a way that capitalized on the Saturn's hardware, to focus on things the Saturn could do that he knew the PS1 couldn't. The Saturn was weaker than the PlayStation when it came to raw 3D rendering power, but it could draw and tile 2D sprites extremely effectively. Using this, the team could create the wide open world and sense of unending progression they sought as the dragon flew towards the never-ending horizon which stretched out in every direction. The endless horizon characterizes Panzer Dragoon's eerie, isolated atmosphere and helps mask some more common technical limitations of the time, like pop-in and low draw distance. Positioned as a true killer app for the Saturn, Panzer Dragoon would become a major part of the Saturn's early marketing strategy in the West. <laughs> Panzer Dragoon is a 1995 rail shooter for the Sega Saturn. The game takes roughly an hour to finish, which is honestly more of a blessing than a curse. The cinematic ambitions of the game are very well suited to a lower runtime, one that encourages players to repeatedly loop back into the more arcadey score attack elements on offer. While it may seem a little strange now to speak of a cinematic, artistically motivated game as one meant to be constantly replayed for higher scores, games at the time were very often score-driven with a high focus on replayability. 
Panzer Dragoon's much more cinematic take on the genre was pretty novel in this case, shaking up a relatively straightforward genre at the time. In that way, Panzer Dragoon's actually a pretty interesting innovation, one that marries the rewatchability of home video entertainment and fantasy storytelling with compelling, replayable arcade gameplay in a very visually impressive package. There are six levels, dubbed episodes, in a cinematic flourish so quaint and transparent in its posturing that it wraps around to become strangely effective. We are visitors to Panzer Dragoon's world and story, seeing it through a very limited, very intentionally framed lens. Our perspective starts and stops along a timescale that isn't made particularly clear. Does this first episode take place immediately after the opening cutscene, or has Kyle flown on the back of the Blue Dragon for a couple days now? This lends to this overt, sort of dreamlike quality, and it's one of my favorite aspects of the game's framing. Armed with an ancient gun, players can tap the large face buttons on the Saturn controller to fire blasts at enemies for big damage. Holding one of the fire buttons down will engage Lock-On, allowing the dragon to fire its arrows of light, these huge tracking lasers that erupt from its throat. This is great for taking down large groups of enemies or hitting faster, more difficult to hit opponents. One of the benefits to this approach is the ability to slide one's finger across all three large face buttons on the Saturn controller to quickly burst fire and then stop on one of the buttons on a dime to switch to lock on. This has the added benefit of making a turbo button less advantageous in this game compared to other shooters of the time. The gameplay is balanced around this push and pull of strong single hits and slightly weaker but more forgiving AoE attacks. Bringing it together is the game's 360 degree rotational view. By using the shoulder buttons, players are able to swivel their view fully around Kyle and the dragon. Not only is this a great showcase of the Saturn's infinite horizon, it's also a strategically exciting fold that adds extra complexity to encounters. There's a mastery in knowing exactly where and how to place the reticle efficiently as to hit oncoming targets. The added chaos that erupts as you swing your camera around to take down stragglers you missed or meet a flanking opponent makes for some really excellent high-tension gameplay. Of special note are the game's boss fights, which heavily feature enemies that will change position around the player, forcing them to pay close attention to enemy openings and position proactively. When facing any direction other than forward, the dragon's evasive movement is locked which makes being surrounded an even bigger risk. This increases the mental stack needed to handle threats as they come at you from these different angles and gives the boss fights a very fast-paced, tactical feeling. After its release, Panzer Dragoon was lauded for revolutionizing the rail shooter genre on home console and was considered a killer app for the Saturn. It swept Game of the Year awards for Sega's console and was hotly recommended in publications covering the system. <laughs> Panzer Dragoon Zwei would begin development quickly after the completion of Panzer Dragoon 1. Released less than a year after the original, Zwei takes the systems of the original Panzer Dragoon and evolves them, quite literally, giving the player multiple paths to navigate and multiple forms for the dragon to transform into based on player performance. Sega could feel the walls closing in around them as the PlayStation began to take hold and Saturn sales declined, and this feeling of impending doom trickled down to Team Andromeda, who felt pressure to complete development on the game as quickly as possible while also moving on to their next Panzer Dragoon project, a game called Saga. This led to an extremely complex and rocky development cycle where Zvi and Saga would be worked on concurrently, requiring the workforce to split significantly between the two projects where Sega and Team Andromeda were betting on Saga's epic scale to combat the oncoming titan that would be Final Fantasy VII, Zvi would be a much more intimate game, enhancing the experience of the first Panzer Dragoon for fans of the original and newcomers alike. Directed by Kondo Tomohiro, this small and agile team would focus on honing what the original game already did well, rather than change directions. Still, Zvi has a slightly different feel than the original, with more focus on story and world building taken from different inspirations. Encouraged by series director Kusunoki Manabu, Zvi would lean into a darker and more intimate tale of conflict and loss, one that focused on the human cost of warfare and the psychological toll it collected from its participants. 
Following original goals laid out by Futatsugi, Zwei would be an important stepping stone in widening the world of Panzer Dragoon in preparation for Saga's much larger scale exploration of the setting. This sense of measured, incremental growth is the major throughline of Zwei's gameplay and story. Focusing on a young rancher named Jean-Jacques Lundy and his mutant Coolia, Lagi, the game charts his journey to take revenge on an autonomous flying fortress that destroyed his home in response to Lagi's awakening as a dragon. The gameplay of Zvi charts Lagi's growth from beast of burden to winged death as he takes down the Imperial fleet pursuing the fortress and then the autonomous precursor weaponry that protects it. Through the course of the game, players take alternate paths which grant Lagi different levels of experience based on how difficult they are to clear. This is an inspired choice, not only spinning the replay flywheel that the first game indulged in, but also by making the game itself more accessible. Panzer Dragoon's Vi has a variant difficulty level that ranges from significantly easier than the original to much harder in some levels if you're aiming for max evolution and clear rate. The game encourages player mastery by allowing exploration of these differing routes and giving players the option to save between levels, minimizing the cost of death and making practice much easier than in the original. Another interesting side effect of the branching pass was the change to how music functions. The original Panzer Dragoon was scored from start to finish to match the progression of the episodes, which would not be possible here due to the branching nature of Spy's levels. All of the music in Zvi was sequenced and played back using pulse code modulation, giving it an extremely unique and futuristic sound that still is amazing to this day. Given all of these refinements, it's easy to look back on the groundbreaking original as a tech demo for Zvi, a game that walked so Zvi could run. This sentiment was shared by many reviewers of the time who noted the relatively incremental but welcome additions to the formula. Much attention was also paid to the improvements to the storytelling and cutscenes in the game, which also ran longer and more frequently than the cutscenes of the original. The game has multiple endings as well, though the changes are relatively small between them, with really only two major outcomes. One for the standard dragon forms Loggy is able to access during progression, and one for reaching the final stage of evolution, the solo wing, the blue armored dragon from the first game. We'll talk more about that particular revelation when we discuss the series narrative as a whole, but it's worth noting that Zvi was developed as a prequel, a choice that allowed the team to keep the dreamlike and self-contained nature of the first Panzer Dragoon intact while also expanding on the setting and laying the groundwork for future entries. All this being said, the evolution of the Panzer Dragoon series did not stop with Zvi. Indeed, Zvi was just a stepping stone to a larger change, one that Sega was hoping would reposition them as the home entertainment trailblazers they fashioned to be. With all eyes on the PlayStation and Square's upcoming masterpiece Final Fantasy VII looming over the market, Sega looked to Team Andromeda as their strongest hope against the juggernaut they faced. The goal originally was to beat Square to market on an epic JRPG, one that could stand up against the spectacle on offer with Final Fantasy VII, and potentially leapfrog it in terms of storytelling and technology. The Saturn's 3D rendering capabilities were much weaker than the PlayStation's, this much was known, but that wouldn't stop Sega. Final Fantasy VII's marketing was heavily focused on this push for 3D and CG cinematics, and Sega knew they'd need to fight to keep up. Things would need to change to accommodate a game of Saga's scope. Big dreams were laid out for the title, including a hefty serving of FMV cutscenes, and perhaps most impressively for a console JRPG in the mid-90s, fully voiced dialogue for all characters in the game world. The game would, eventually, ship on four discs, one more than Final Fantasy VII's three. But with a relatively quick runtime of only about 25 hours going slow, Saga's scope would be a double-edged sword for Team Andromeda, simultaneously forcing them to focus on what worked and push the envelope when it came to storytelling and design, while also limiting them strictly in what they could and could not do. According to Futatsugi, each challenge seemed doable alone, but because we tried to do so much all at once, it was really tough. 
These were all things that we saw as lacking in the games that we played. So we put it all into this game. We found that it was super hard to make. A full year of development time was spent prototyping the new battle system. Fitting a rail shooter into a JRPG format is pretty hard to even conceptualize, but Panzer Dragoon Saga does it quite elegantly. Zvai director Kondo Tomohiro sought to emphasize and incorporate the elements of battle that heightened the experience in the original game, specifically its focus on directionality and player maneuvering. Early prototypes tried to implement a real-time, fully controllable viewport just like the original games had, with players shifting their vision around to target different enemies, but these prototypes were reworked when Mukayama Akihiko took over battle planning for the title. The system was simplified to enhance the feeling of positionality in space. Battles now take place in a diameter centering on the enemy instead of the player. The coup de gras that pulls it all together is a positional threat system that changes the attacks that enemies can do based on where the player is positioned. Some areas may pose a threat to the player, but an enemy weak point may only be accessible from that location. And inversely, safe spots on the radar may help the player avoid attacks, but significantly decrease their offensive output. Saga's battle system would also focus on quick threat assessment and management. Not only would the safe zones change rapidly over the course of the fight, but experience and loot would be tied to how fast and efficiently a player could eliminate targets. I find this to be such an elegant and exciting implementation of the previous rail shooter game's focus on player mastery in the score attack, adapting the sense of growth over replays into a JRPG's focus on repeated, random encounters where the player must execute their learnings to minimize the amount of time spent grinding. Key to it all is the evolution system, which serves as a kind of class system for the dragon. By manipulating the dragon's combat stats on a grid, the dragon can morph into different forms suited for different aspects of combat, allowing players a degree of control over playstyle and a strategic element of counterplay against enemy weaknesses and strengths. Saga is a game designer's delight, full of little inspired flourishes like this that unite game design concepts from different schools of thought under a uniquely cohesive umbrella. It wasn't always easy, though. Multiple camps and factions existed within Team Andromeda during Saga's development, bitterly fighting for the soul of the game. Artists wanted to push against the Saturn's processing power to show off their creature designs and animations at the cost of mechanical computation and system bandwidth. Systems designers fought against a ballooning scope and memory limits to ensure the game was playable at all, and the newly contracted RPG system designers struggled to adapt typical genre convention to the goals of the previously action and shooting focused creative team. The atmosphere at Team Andromeda during Saga's development was notoriously toxic, clicky, and brutal. Futatsugi, who lacked management experience on this scale, came down hard on the teams to force them to work together and meet their deadlines after a series of devastating developmental and logistics-based delays. Panzer Dragoon Saga would eventually release in Japan on January 8th, 1998, almost a full year after Final Fantasy VII. The cost was high, not just for Sega, but for the team itself. Two members of Team Andromeda died as a result of development, one due to a motor accident caused by crunch stress and a lack of sleep, and the other to suicide attributed to the harsh working conditions on the team, a fact that haunts Futonsugi to this day. The release also had its own troubles. The Saturn was in heavy decline, and Sega was on its last legs preparing for the Dreamcast, starting the next console generation on the back foot. Sega wanted a game that would sell over a million copies, with only about 20,000 discs printed in the US and an estimated 1,000 in Europe. Saga was effectively dead on arrival, where the Saturn had been long since vanquished by the PlayStation. Not all was bad, though. At release, Saga would be critically acclaimed and lauded for its utterly fascinating world and fully realized characters. Truly unlike anything else on offer at the time, Saga became the Saturn's most treasured gem, the game that pushed the system and the team that made it to their absolute limits. Despite this, Sega reacted very negatively, as one would expect. The team was brought together for a post-mortem, where they blamed a variety of factors on the game's low sales. Their creative ambitions, their artistic influences, and the state of the market They'd set out to make something new, interesting, and inherently niche, 
and they did. Sega would go on to dissolve Team Andromeda after Saga's failure, and the IP would go dormant. That is, until Orta, of course. Panzer Dragoon Orta started as an elevator pitch for a Panzer Dragoon title for the Dreamcast, quickly dismissed as their technical goals were more lofty than reality could accommodate in 2000. Producer Kawagoe Takayuki would sit on the idea until Sega's fateful partnership with Microsoft, and their newly released Xbox inspired him once more. Believing the Xbox to be powerful enough to support the artistic and creative ambitions befitting a Panzer Dragoon title, Kawagoe courted members of the previous Team Andromeda, including Mukayama, who stubbornly refused multiple times before finally caving to Kawagoe's tenacious request that he direct the game lest the franchise die for good. Orta's shape changed significantly over the course of development at Smilebit, a studio that housed many of the Team Andromeda alumni. The team toyed with the idea of leveraging the Xbox's online capabilities to make it more of a multiplayer-focused game, an idea interestingly paralleled by Futatsuki's own Phantom Dust, which released on the console in 2004. Prior experience with the Dreamcast and its Windows CE-based operating system gave the team the well-needed experience to optimize for the Xbox, as they were already acquainted with the DirectX pipeline that the system's rendering was based in. No longer constrained by the limits of the Saturn, the team at Smilebit could more effectively realize the world of Panzer Dragoon. Orta exists as a coda to the original series, commenting on and similarly calling back to the series' roots as a rail shooter. That doesn't mean that Saga's influence wasn't also present, though. Kobayashi Saori would return as the lead composer for the game's score, and so would Iwade Takashi and Yoshida Kentaro, who worked on the cutscenes and 3D models of the previous games. So too would Saga's positional combat return in Orta during boss battles, where the player can maneuver the dragon around its targets in order to hit weak points and bypass dangerous attacks. The evolution system would return from Zvai and Saga as well, this time more streamlined around specific functionality. Orta's dragon can maneuver between three forms, one powerful, one speedy with an automatically targeting shot, and one more balanced between the two. Each form has a different degree of mobility, which makes managing the forms while balancing the dragon's position vital to Orta's combat system. Over the course of the game, the dragons can even level up, and the individual forms will change and get more powerful, something that playfully mimics the feeling of progression and growth so perfectly executed in Sfai and Saga. The game is hard, too, and mastery requires a great deal of practice and awareness, as well as optimization as you level your dragon's forms. Every aspect of Orda is a love letter to Panzer Dragoon as a series, one made by a more mature team, one far wiser and more knowledgeable than they were when they were breaking new ground on the Saturn. The final release in the series, Panzer Dragoon Orda would garner praise from critics for its cinematic storytelling and nail-biting difficulty. In a way, Orda is Panzer Dragoon in its most essential, most refined form, the final lap for a series broken by the ambition of its artists and the bitter rivalries cultivated during the console wars. Panzer Dragoon was conceptualized as a story-driven series, and it tells a nearly century-long epic charting a prophecy dragon's fight against the remnants of the civilization that birthed it, spanning the lives of the faithful people that rode it into battle. Now, if you want to experience these games in their story with all of the twists and turns, you can skip forward to 2 hours, 48 minutes, 30 seconds. I'll give you uh, some time to just make your way there. Oh, you guys liking the video so far? Put a lot of work into it. Looking forward to continuing with the video. All right, that was probably enough time, right? Well, in the words of Sam Reich, there's no way to begin but beginning, so let's start where it all begins. Panzer Dragoon Zvi. Chronologically speaking, the second game comes first, about 20 years before the first Panzer Dragoon, so this is where the story really begins. 
We open on a boy named Jean-Jacques Lundy, a livestock farmer in a small village called Elpis on the outskirts of the empire near the border with the Mechania Federation. He raises Coolia, beasts of burden, and is tasked with killing any that manifest mutant biology due to a superstition that states mutant Coolia with glowing throats are omens of great destruction. Lundy, just a 14-year-old boy according to the manual, struggles with his responsibility due to his view that all life is born equal. One night, one of his Coolia falls ill and dies during childbirth. Despite facing cruel punishment from his father for failing to remedy its illness, Lundy harbors a secret. The stillborn foal is still alive, a winged mutant he could not bring himself to kill that he's been raising in secret since birth. He names the creature Loggy, and the two form a powerful friendship. He believes that Loggy resembles a dragon, and despite the village superstition, thinks the creature is special in some way. We flash forward a year to the Imperial capital. The Emperor schemes for a means to win in the conflict against Mechania, a foreign nation of unified city-states seeking to curb the Empire's aggressive expansion and acquisition of ancient and powerful precursor technology. Following reports of a massive precursor ship sighted in the skies above the frontier, he readies his fleet in a bid to take the Flying Fortress in hopes that it will provide him an advantage in the coming war. Over the course of the past year, Lundy's been training Loggy in secret, and Loggy's grown to full size with remarkable speed. Believing Loggy might be capable of flight, Lundy takes him out of the village to train, when suddenly, from the cliffside overlooking his home, he watches as the flying fortress from the ancient age destroys the village in a blast of light. There, Loggy awakens, mourning the loss of his home by emitting arrows of light from his throat in defiance of the wanton destruction ahead of him. With nothing left, Lundi and Lagi pursue the ship through the burning ruins of the town, driven by a need for revenge and a strange overpowering feeling that they must stop the airship from reaching its destination. Just as he begins to catch up with it, Lagi makes his first attempt to take to the sky. Before he can reach it though, he's tackled out of the air by a mysterious dark dragon that protects the ancient ship. Traveling for three days, Lindy encounters a caravan that claims to have sighted the airship flying towards the border to the Empire. Pursuing this lead, Loggy and Lindy end up in the middle of a fight between Mechania and the Empire. Using their reclaimed weaponry from the Ancient Age, the Empire turns their focus on Loggy. Lindy describes the event as walking into a battle between warring gods ancient technology raining hellfire down upon them despite being piloted by mere men. Lundi and Lagi are forced to quickly adapt to the conditions of war, suddenly thrust into this conflict without a choice in the matter. It's here that Lagi flies, truly, for the first time, shedding his skin and evolving into a new form that more closely resembles a dragon. Twelve days later, the Imperial fleet catches up to them, driving the two down into the forest. Lundi, conflicted by the killings, fears what he'll have to become in order to see this through to the end. As they make their way through the forest, they're attacked by a Golia, one of the autonomous weapons that was seen in the ruins of his village, proving to him that they were on the path to the Flying Fortress. After dispatching the enemy, they find the entrance to one of the ancient ruins and seek shelter inside. It's here, in these ruins, that they become more well acquainted with the previously dormant living weaponry of the ancient age. As they fly through the tunnels, they come to life, awakening to protect the subsystem and its secrets. Deep below, in an underground lake, they fight a mutated fish-like creature and escape back to the surface. They follow the trail of the ancient airship to a gigantic crystal lake known as Georgias. For two days, they search under light snowfall and fend off more mutated creatures and remnants of the ancient age that return to power in the airship's wake. Loggy is quickly evolving, but the crusade is taking its toll on Lundi, who's losing his grip on his previous life as it fades to the importance of the mission. After fending off the lake's automated guardian, they find the ship in the sky, high above the clouds. 
As they watch it hover there above Georgius, the dark dragon makes its presence known to them and enters the ship. Suddenly shaken with fear, Lundi and Lagi begin their assault. Responding to the dragon's presence, the battleship truly awakens, leveling the full force of its autonomous fleet in living weaponry against Lagi and Lundi. Lagi's destructive power is incredible, convincing Lundi that he is indeed the destructive dragon foretold in legend. He wonders if his friend's heart has changed too, like his has. They blow the wings off one side of the airship and then take out its defense system, sinking it into the clouds over Georgius and putting it back to sleep. But the battle isn't over yet. Emerging from where the ship descended, a massive, fully evolved dark dragon comes to fend off Lagi, who himself has evolved into a final and more powerful form, that of the blue dragon, the Solo Wing. The Dark Leviathan sends missiles and volleys at Lagi, but it's no match for the Dragon of Destruction at his most powerful. Reduced to its original form, the Dark Dragon begins a frenetic, desperate attempt to escape Loggy's wrath, but the two chase it across the surface of Georgius's crystal lake. The battle is tense, a swirling dogfight where up and down are easily confused, the sky reflecting off the surface of the lake and blending at the horizon in a psychedelic but somber kaleidoscope. After delivering the killing blow, Lagi and Lundi watch as their enemy plummets through the sky, bringing its unfathomable secrets deep beneath the icy cool waves of the lake to rest once more. After the battle with the Dark Dragon, the two catch up with the slowly descending fortress. Using his powers, Lagi telekinetically transports Lundi to safety, quickly ascending to meet the fortress as Lundi is forced to watch in confusion as the sky erupts with light. Lundi is sent rocketing through time and space, a hallucinatory jumble of images imprinted on his mind. Another time, another rider, a murdered drone in a destroyed village. Lundi understands it all, from Lagi's birth to his evolution to the Solo Wing. The destruction of a tower linked intrinsically with the destruction of the Flying Fortress. Lagi had a mission, and he would return someday, flown by someone else. The images became clearer. Lagi would guide them in a battle against another dragon to take out another part of this strange, ancient network. This would not be the last the world saw of winged death, the dragon of destruction. Lundi awakens with a start, alone. The war has taken the last thing he had left, his friend, Lagi. Seeking answers, Lundi finds the wreckage of the Flying Fortress. Venturing inside, he finds it dormant, with no signs of life, just an empty, desolate ruin. The monsters that used to swarm this place are nowhere to be seen, and so he ventures further within. There, inside that great antechamber, Proof that his vision was no mere hallucination. High up upon the wall, a massive crest emblazoned with the image of a dragon, its throat pulsing with light. Lagi's light. With the mysterious ship deactivated and Loggy's mission complete for the time being, 
Lundi is forced to seek new purpose in the world Lagi left behind. Over the course of the next two decades, the Empire's aggression would increase as it expanded its boundaries and sought more ancient relics for military conquest. As Mechania fell to the Empire, an elusive faction known as the Seekers would emerge amongst the disparate rebellion efforts across the land. Primarily nomadic and very secretive, they attempted to investigate and learn about the ancient ruins that the Empire sought so fervently. Far off in the middle of a distant ocean under darkened skies, the Imperial military announces the commencement of an operation as they circle a large stone tower standing tall above the waves. Riding through a desert canyon on Kulia, the hunter Kyle Fluga and his companion stop under the shadow of an airship flying overhead. So far removed from the war effort out here in the desert, they wonder whose side the ship fights for. For the people of the frontier, concerns about food and supplies take more precedence than the squabbles of their worldly overlords. Suddenly, they're attacked by mutant creatures. Kyle pursues them down the canyon and finds the entrance to an ancient ruin hiding in the valley walls. Inside, Kyle wanders onto an elevator platform which stirs to life amidst the long deactivated corpses of the autonomous weaponry within. Being lifted into the heart of the ruin, he finds the corpse of the creature that attacked him. He barely escapes with his life when a pure type living weapon drops from the ceiling and kills his Coolia. Armed with nothing but a crossbow, Kyle tries in vain to discourage the creature. Just as it has him backed into a corner and is about to strike, the ceiling caves in and crushes the monster. An armored blue dragon flies in, an unknown drone upon its back equipped with ancient armor and weaponry. Following in hot pursuit, a black dragon with a similar rider fires a volley of light down around Kyle and chases the blue dragon inside. An explosion deep within the ruins rips a hole in the wall, sending Kyle flying outward onto a cliffside where he watches the dueling dragons fight in the sky. Narrowly avoiding a blast from the Dark Dragon's rider, Loggy's drone looks back in horror as the shot explodes on the ground, destroying a nearby settlement completely. In that moment of hesitation, the Black Dragon sends an arrow of light through the drone's chest, killing him before departing for the sea. The dragon lands by Kyle, the drone telepathically implanting a mission into his mind in a hallucinatory dream sequence much like the one Lundi saw at the end of Svi. Do not let the dark dragon arrive at the tower, he says. Loggy knows the way. And so, mounting the morning dragon, Kyle takes the drone's gun and sets off for the horizon, taking one last look down at the companions he left on the ground below. Sometime later, Kyle and Loggy fly through the ruins of a submerged city, fending off the local wildlife as they chase the prototype dragon just like Loggy and Lundi had pursued years prior. Eventually, they encounter an Imperial military Naraka-class battleship, which immediately fires upon them, aware of the destruction these dragons can cause from their previous encounter with Loggy and Lundi years before. Of course, it's no match for Loggy, who's already reached his full potential, having evolved into the solo wing before Kyle ever met him. Look 
Far off above the clouds, the Imperial fleet receives a transmission confirming the existence of the dragons and begins their tracking operation, preparing for an ambush. Loggy and Kyle travel across a desert and fend off sandworms and other pests until the dark dragon swoops in from behind and attacks from the cover of the oncoming sandstorm. Loggy and Kyle fight off the dragon, then pursue it deeper into the desert. Night descends, and as they fly through the mesas and plateaus that dot the landscape, they find themselves ambushed by the Imperial fleet. Here, they've stumbled upon an Imperial excavation site of some kind. Loggy and Kyle take this opportunity to take the fight to the Empire and assault the operation. As they take down more of the mining facilities, the military uses a prototype assault ship created from the excavated technology as their last ditch effort to fend off the dragon and its rider. After Loggy and Kyle take it down, they flee into a nearby cave pursued by Imperial gliders. The cave is a system of ancient subterranean tunnels. Kyle quickly dispatches the gliders, but as he ventures deeper inside, it becomes clear that the ruins are awakening to Loggy's presence, just like what had happened with him in Lundi two decades prior. Ancient weapons slowly come to life, and doors struggle to open against years of debris and wear. The weaponry here is unlike anything the military had available, with beam weapons and automated sentries that move in from various side tunnels and paths that make up this strange underground network. In their search for a way out, they fly over a dormant guardian, a massive automaton that lurches to life to protect the ruins from Loggy's assault. Its weaponry is powerful, with large blade-like arms, electrical volleys, and a laser beam that it shoots from its eye. But it too is no match for Loggy, the Dragon of Destruction. As they surface above a forest canopy, the Dark Dragon rushes past them. The Imperial fleet launches its ambush and pursues the two dragons, beginning their capture operation. Loggy and Kyle fight them off as they fly over the forest, eventually making their way to a huge, floating Imperial stronghold bolstered with ancient technology. It moves slowly, and Loggy is able to deftly maneuver around its attacks. They're quickly able to dismantle its weaponry and destroy the engine, sending it hurtling into the forest below. Loggy and Kyle continue to chase the prototype dragon as it enters the range of the tower, awakening it in the living weaponry inside. Bursting from the ocean, an army of pure type living weaponry destroys the surrounding Imperial military ships and readies for war. The dueling dragons enter the Imperial capital, and Kyle finds the city under assault from the pure type creatures of the ancient tower. They fight their way through the war zone, chaos erupting around them as the city falls. Unfortunately, they fail to stop the dark dragon before it reaches the tower. The tower greets the dragon, opening its gates so that it may enter inside and be raised to full strength. As the tower awakens, the prototype dragon emerges augmented with armor and weaponry just like the guardian dragon that Lundi and Loggy fought those years ago. It's clear now that the tower, the dragons, and the flying fortress are connected somehow, intrinsically augmenting each other and working in tandem for some purpose. The one exception between them is Loggy, the heralded Dragon of Destruction. With no choice but to fight another Guardian, Loggy and Kyle battle the creature until it falls into the water.
History repeats itself once more as Loggy descends into the tower. Deep inside, he telekinetically protects Kyle, carrying his rider to safety as he plunges into the tower and destroys it from within. Far off on a distant beach, Kyle awakens to the sun breaking through the clouds. The dragon's footprints surround him, but the creature is nowhere to be seen. Like Lundi before him, he has lost a home to this war he was pulled into without a choice, and now is left with new purpose as he leaves his old life behind. Thirty years would pass before the Dragon of Destruction would fly again. In that time, a young, common-born military upstart named Kraman would rise through the ranks of the Imperial Academy, showing incredible combat and strategic prowess. Granted lordship and named the commander of the Imperial Black Fleet, Kraman became the Emperor's attack dog, often dispatched to root out seekers and protect excavated military assets. Working at one such excavation site was a young man named Edge. Raised by the other workers, Edge and his found family took various odd jobs in order to make ends meet. He and his friend Rua exchanged small talk in Panzeries, musing about the nature of the job. It just so happened that the Empire paid well for excavation work, so they'd been stationed west of the Geralt Desert, at an old site protected by monster nets, Huge fans meant to disrupt air currents and prevent monsters from attacking the region. Rua urges Edge to relax, but as he does, chaos erupts within the dig site. A monster has awoken in the ruin, a mortal threat to the workers who are ill-equipped to deal with it. In the sky above, the Black Fleet makes haste for the mine after picking up the mercenary's distress signal. Here, Kraman and his lieutenant, Arwen, take this as an opportunity to enact their plan. They seek to betray the Empire and deny the Emperor what he was looking for at the excavation site. Inside, Edge rushes to aid his companions. Drawing the monster's attention away from the other miners, he scrambles to avoid its attacks as it destroys a large section of the mine's inner wall. There, in the rubble, Edge finds a woman embedded in the wall, sleeping in some sort of stasis pod. The creature seems to show some deference to the woman, pausing long enough for Edge to grab a rocket launcher and send it careening down into the abyss. Edge regroups with the other mercenaries as they make for the exit, knowing that the creature most likely isn't dead yet. But as they exit from the mine, the captain is shot dead by Zastava, an imposing and burn-covered member of the Black Fleet. Despite pleas from the workers who try to claim that they're on the same side, the militia, now an open rebellion towards the Empire, murders all the witnesses. In his haste to get answers, Ed reveals that they found a woman inside the mine, to which Kraman shows great interest. Edge is knocked out as the crew enter the mine to investigate his claim. When Edge awakens, everyone is dead, and the Black Fleet is leaving with the woman in tow. Rising from the canyon on a glider, Zastava curses Edge one last time and shoots him in the chest, sending him down into the ravine. As the ship pulls away, a massive explosion set by Kraman and Arwen goes off in the Imperial capital. The Emperor quickly determines that the Black Fleet is behind it and identifies a tower as Kraman's ultimate goal. He sorties the Imperial warship Gregorig for battle against Kraman and his forces. War has broken out within the Empire. In a surreal, psychedelic void filled with strange symbols, the player is asked to give their name. When a name is chosen, a moat of light coalesces deep within the ancient ruin at the bottom of the ravine, descending into the water 
and into Edge and returning him to life. He awakens deep below the surface of the ruin, miraculously healed of his wounds. Confused, he wonders how he's alive. And interestingly, his voice is now presented to us in Japanese. Fumbling through the dark, he activates the ancient technology of the ruin, finding a gun etched with a dragon design. Taking it, he rides an elevator up to a higher level. A group of creatures begin marching to attack him, and he readies the gun he found, but finds it unable to fire. Arrows of light rain down from above, and Edge is rescued by a dragon. It seems drawn to him, and immediately forms a psychic bond, not unlike the ones we saw with Lundi and Kyle before him. Edge is granted a vision of the dragon's mission, a kaleidoscope of images and colors swirling around him as he's given divine purpose. The woman from the mine features heavily in these images, as memories of the previous dragon rider's journeys swirl in his mind. There on an island in the center of a body of water, a gigantic tower and the dragon flying towards it. As if guided by the hand of destiny, Edge climbs atop the dragon and becomes his rider. Rising up from the depths on the back of the dragon, Edge's goal is to return to the excavation site to look for survivors. The dragon is extremely powerful compared to the weapons available to Edge and the crew, but it's clear to the player that the dragon is still quite young. His arrows of light are limited in range and quantity, and he looks to still be in adolescent form. Back at the excavation site, Edge can find the captain, the man who raised him, on the precipice of death. With the last of his strength, he encourages Edge to pursue Kraman to recover the girl as a bargaining chip, suggesting that the Empire is likely to kill him to clean up loose ends and prevent the news of the Black Fleet's rebellion from spreading in the frontier. Before he dies, he tells Edge to take his journal from his chest pocket. In the journal, Edge reads the captain's true feelings, including the reason the crew took the mining job in the first place, to raise the money to enroll Edge in the Imperial Academy and guarantee him a future. As the captain dies, Edge swears to seek revenge. Edge makes his way through the valley, turning off the wind nets to ensure the young dragon's flight isn't disrupted by the fans. This has the unintentional side effect of also allowing monsters to return to the valley. As they pass deeper into the valley, they come upon the wreckage of an Imperial ship. Retrieving the flight recorder, Edge learns that the dragon was originally being held captive on the ship, but that the Black Fleet had fired on them as it arrived in the valley, allowing the dragon to escape. Edge wonders if there might be other dragons in Imperial captivity as well. The rest of the valley has far more monsters than the safer section that housed the excavation site. As the two fight their way out, they encounter a strange little man riding a coolia being pursued by a gigantic mutant creature. Rushing to his aid, they fend off the large arachnoth that made the valley its home. Once it's dealt with, Edge and the dragon land and speak with the man, who's completely flabbergasted by the connection between the dragon and its rider. He suggests the creature might be a good weapon against the Empire, assuring Edge that he isn't with Kraman, but instead a different group, the Seekers. He introduces himself as Gash, and offers to share his people's knowledge with Edge in exchange for providing safe passage to the nearby village of Kainus. When they arrive, they find that the village has been decimated. Gash believes the town was destroyed by monsters and suggests that they stay there overnight so he can study the wreckage and learn what caused the uproar. They talk over the campfire that night. To Gash's people, the Seekers, dragons are seen as messengers of the gods and weapons of divine intervention. He suggests that the Empire has been lying about them and twisting the folklore and superstition to make people fear them rather than worship them as saviors, blaming them for the destruction of the ancient age and humanity's fall from grace. 
As they talk about Edge's plans for revenge, Gash takes a special interest in the dragon, his eyes locked on it the entire time they speak. When asked what his goal is, Gash mocks Edge, claiming that he's not out to kill anyone like Edge is. Instead, Gash is on a religious pilgrimage looking for a being known in his people's ancient records as the Divine Visitor. He's tight-lipped on the details and doesn't want to share any more. Changing the subject, he tells Edge that he found a coded message written in another Seeker's blood that claimed Kraman's fleet had roused the monsters and led them to destroy the surrounding villages intentionally. The Seekers seem to be staging quite the guerrilla operation with their opposition to the Empire here in the frontier. Continuing their campfire chat, Gash reveals that the Seekers and the Black Fleet had been at odds for some time due to their mutual interest in ancient ruins, the source of the Empire's stockpile of ancient technology. Gash finds this troubling. While some nations view the ancient age as the time of paradise, he has difficulty reconciling this with the reality of the horrific and terrible living weaponry that originate from the era. Gash is a strange little guy, and as our first introduction to the Seeker organization proper, he straddles the line between being deeply suspicious and a trustworthy resource. The two settle on continuing eastward together across the Geralt Desert. The Geralt Desert is a large wasteland home to mostly docile sandworms. Largely unremarkable, it does house the wreckage of various old crafts, as well as a few ancient ruins. Gash, ever helpful, gives Edge advice on how to combat enemies as you traverse the sands. Eventually, he'll point out a Latham, a massive, manta ray-like creature that lives under the sand. So slow-moving and large, mold and greenery grows on its back. Gash calls it the most disgusting thing alive. It can vent hot, stinky air in self-defense, but it's otherwise unable to contest the dragon's assault. In the center of the desert, they find an oasis, and after a small puzzle to open the entrance to the ruins at its center, Gash and Edge descend through the underground tunnel to the other side of the canyon, where they find an underground cave system. A beautiful blue insect creature known as a Gigrelyph attacks them, which fights back until it's devoured by a much larger host body. They fend off the Gigrelyph and begin making their way out of the tunnel as Edge's dragon evolves into a new form. The Gigrelyph isn't letting up, though, and attempts to block their exit until Edge's dragon changes forms again, temporarily boosting its own defensive capabilities with a telekinetic shield before morphing back to launch a volley of lightning at the creature, defeating it for good. Edge is stunned by these sudden shifts, to which Gash suggests that this dragon may in fact be the one. When they arrive at the surface, Gash opts to travel the rest of the way alone. Before he leaves, though, he gives Edge a pendant as a token of friendship and a sign of good faith, saying that the local nomads will recognize it and help him if he speaks to them, as long as they don't find out about his dragon. Out in the frontier, Edge encounters the nomads that Gash had alluded to. A small group of hunters and their children, they travel light with just a few tents and wagons pulled by a few coolia they raise, eking out a living by selling scavenged tech and equipment made from the chitinous shells of felt monsters. They're tightly knit and extremely wary of outsiders, and they initially distrust Edge, assuming he's just another member of the Imperial forces that heckled them as they pass through the area. The man running the vendor tent even refuses to take Edge's Imperial currency. Inside one of the others, Edge meets Anyu, the leader of the Nomads, and an accomplished hunter himself. He's initially quite guarded, like the rest of the encampment, but when he recognizes Gash's pendant, he laughs and curses the Empire, then offers Edge a seat. Gash has sent others to the caravan in the past, and Anyo notes that trouble is never far behind those who buddy up with the Seekers. Turns out that the caravan had run into some of the folks that fit the Black Fleet's description three days prior, and that they'd ransacked the camp and commandeered their weapons and medicine, leaving them undersupplied for the rest of their journey through the desert. They ventured northward, toward an area known as the Forbidden Zone, a dangerous ruin beset by a weather anomaly known as a gravity storm that's so violent it's torn battleships from the sky. 
The area is so deadly that Anyo encourages Edge to just let the storm and its monsters take care of his revenge for him, washing his hands of the matter entirely. Refusing to call it quits, though, Edge's tenacity makes an impression on Anyo. Though he won't guide Edge to the Forbidden Zone, he offers to speak to Baika, the caravan's trader, seeing this as an opportunity for mutual benefit. The nomads need supplies and money for the rest of their journey, and Edge needs their wares if he's going to survive the battles ahead. Outside, Anyo reveals that he and his family, his wife Ko, his daughter Faye, and his son Inkok, are survivors from a dying land that were chased from their home by invasive monsters. Baika, the trader, came along with them. He most notably sells useful gun upgrades, indicating that he has some degree of understanding with ancient technology. They've also hired a mercenary named Raoul to assist Anyo with hunts and protection as their numbers dwindled. He recognizes Kraman's fleet as a special imperial force, but is tight-lipped and refuses to say much more. With nothing else to go on, Edge departs for the Forbidden Zone. Flying northward, Edge comes to the middle of a great lake. Amidst a storm, an ancient machine whirs to life as an intruder alert chimes in response to the dragon's presence, drawing the attention of the surrounding autonomous bioweaponry, as the machine states that the sky transporter will be sealed until the lock is manually disengaged. Interfacing with the keys dispersed around the area, the transporter unlocks and lifts the dragon above the clouds, where Edge finally catches up with the Black Fleet. Shock spreads across Kraman's troops as they confirm the sight of a dragon model organism, something they didn't believe was actually real. Destroying the escort ships draws the attention of Arwen, Kraman's right hand man, which forces Edge to focus fire on the main ship. Edge eventually disables the ship and boards it. Inside, Arwen sits in the commander's chair, deeply wounded. He reveals that this was a trap, a honeypot to distract the enemy while Kraman made his way for the tower. The bridge viewport is blown open by an explosion and a huge dragon descends. The woman from the mine stands tall upon its back, wearing one of the Black Fleet's military jackets. Edge jumps out of the window onto the back of his dragon to meet her in the skies. begging her to stop and claiming he does not want to fight. She states that by opposing Kraman, he's made himself her enemy. Her dragon then fires its arrows of light and Edge is forced to defend himself as she refuses to answer any more of his questions. Her dragon is extremely dangerous and far more evolved than Edge's. It follows the woman's commands obediently, taking aim when told, and relentlessly outmaneuvering the lesser experienced pair. Calling off the assault, she speaks to her dragon directly. Referring to it as at home, she posits that he has not yet fully awakened, and the two retreat. Rumors of an Imperial investigation into dragon sightings in the Forbidden Zone have already spread to the caravan by the time Edge returns. But it seems like Anya and Raoul had spent the day on a busy but successful hunt, so Edge's cover is still maintained. Opening up to Edge, Baika says that he doesn't have the constitution for hunting, and thus turned to a life of trading in order to provide value to the group. Here, in the caravan, everyone does their part to contribute and help each other. Ko tells Edge that they're headed for the forest of Zoa, a promised land that they believe is protected from the monsters where they hope to find safety. According to the traders they've encountered on their travels, there's a large settlement that lives off the forest's bounty. Fay is still shy around Edge, but with enough prompting she'll warm up to him. Raoul muses that the Zoa settlement is pretty well known, so he's unsure if they'll find a place there. Before Edge departs, he requests a favor. He gives Edge a pan flute and asks him to give it to any survivors from a village known as Verado he might find on his travels. He also asks Edge to avoid revealing its origin, suggesting that he make up a story if anyone asks where he got it from. On the off chance Edge can't find any survivors, Raoul just tells him to keep it for himself. A win-win, so Edge agrees to take it as he departs for the village of Zoa. Protected by high walls and a well-staffed civilian militia, Zoa is an industrious village larger than most other frontier settlements. 
The population is highly religious, with the city split into multiple districts to facilitate their orthodox lifestyle. Outsiders and traders occupy the liberal district, where rules are more lax as to support trade and industry. But inside the center walls of the city is the holy district, where villagers practice their beliefs and avoid mingling with outsiders. To even gain access to this district requires a permit directly issued by town leadership. Living in the holy district is restricted to only the most devout citizens, who eat only food from the forest and live their whole lives on city grounds awaiting a time of judgment known as the Night of Atonement, when the gods are foretold to return and rain judgment down upon the land. Unable to enter this area for now, Et tries to mingle with the various traders and residents of the Liberal District. The people here are pretty down to earth, with simple problems and concerns. Abner, the overnight gatekeeper, is bored of his watch duties and in need of some fast cash, which Edge eagerly lends him. He lives with Sifil, the day guard, and they rotate their duties and usage of the hut accordingly. In the main plaza, traders argue over sales, and inside a shop, Edge meets the town's new shopkeeper, a man named Jared. The shop stocks all sorts of stuff, most of which is made by Jared himself out of scavenged technology and monster parts. Interestingly, he also has a pretty large library of books, including some banned by the Empire. Pleased by Edge's curiosity, he offers to let him take any he's interested in. And here, Edge finds Zoa's religious texts, as well as a mysterious old journal allegedly written by a previous dragon rider. From the journal, Edge learns of the beginning of Jean-Jacques Lundy's story, and of the legendary dragon of destruction, Lagi. He also finds a report on a mysterious flying tower referred to as Shellkoof. We finally have a name for the mysterious airship Lagi and Lundi pursued, as well as its purpose. It was a type of flying, autonomous tower that responds to threats in the environment. This finally gives a more concrete answer as to why Lundi's village was destroyed. It was responding to Lagi's birth as a mutant Kulia and attempting to destroy the threat before it could grow. Exploring the rest of the settlement, Edge meets more of the townsfolk. Aldo is a day laborer, working hard to gain entrance into the Holy District, and there's an old hunter named Radgum who settled in Zoa after losing most of his hunting party to monsters some time before. Not too keen on saying much more about his hunting party's demise, he urges Edge to not stay in Zoa for too long due to his belief that hunters have a responsibility to kill monsters and protect regular people from the horrors of the outside world. Making his way to the bar, Edge finds the waitress Yale, preparing for the night shift. Talking with her, he discovers that she's the last survivor from Verato, and that the town was razed during an imperial attack. Edge gives her the pan flute, allegedly an heirloom passed down by members of the village, and Edge feeds her a story about how he found it in some ruins. Yale's pretty down to earth, and likes working with her hands, admitting to Edge that she prefers farm work to barkeeping. Edge kicks around town until nightfall, learning from one of the more religious townspeople that something known as the Guardian Fire protects Zoa from monster attacks. With nightlife in full swing, Edge returns to the bar, and people open up to him as they drink alcohol distilled from monster fluids. Even the previously rude Aldo opens up a bit as he drowns his sorrows, venting some of his frustration about the people who live in the Holy District he so desperately wants to join. Juba, the bar owner, teases Edge for complimenting the obviously terrible tasting alcohol that he serves. Impressed by Edge's obvious lie, they chat for a bit about the Empire and the Rebellion. Allegedly, there's a tower on the other side of the forest that the Empire has shown some interest in, and suggests Edge speak to a man named Pyatt in the morning if he wants to know more, as apparently Pyatt managed to make a recording machine from ancient technology, which he then used to take a picture of the aforementioned tower. Juba is a great source of information in local rumor, having lived in the Liberal District for some time as a settler who was barred from entering the Holy District by decree of the High Council, a theocracy run by the local High Priest and his cronies. Through Juba, we can see the nature of the citizenry of Zoa and the dichotomy defined by the complex and oppositional cultures that occupy this shared territory under the light of the Guardian Fire. Still, despite their differences, it appears there are some shared beliefs among the townsfolk. When asked about the Seekers, Juba expresses distaste, stating that their so-called desecration of ancient ruins defies common sense and tempts the ire of the gods. 
Snooping around the rest of town after everyone goes to bed, Edge climbs through a passage in an old dried up well and finds it connected to a tiny lot in the back of the holy district. Inside a shed, he finds Bezer, a young boy hoarding supplies who dreams of leaving Zoa for a life of adventure. In exchange for keeping his hideout secret, he offers Edge some nice jewelry. In the morning, Edge heads to the junkyard at the back of town where he finds Pyatt working on some ancient machinery. The two go back and forth for a bit as Edge comes off a bit strong and Pyatt gets prickly about being bothered while he works. But ultimately the two come to an understanding when Edge expresses sympathy for the Seekers and their cause. Still, Pyatt doesn't fully trust Edge and leverages his advantage to strong arm him into finding some tech needed for the repairs he's doing on the ancient glider in exchange for his trust. He points Edge to a region north of the Forbidden Zone, known as Georgias, claiming that there is a bounty of ancient tech to be found there. Back at the caravan, Edge lets Raoul know that he found a survivor from Verato. With the cat out of the bag, Raoul says he's too ashamed to reveal himself to any other survivors, having left his home to enlist with the Empire. When his unit was dispatched to quell the unrest in the frontier where his village was located, he tried to desert and warn them, but by the time he arrived in Verado, the village had already been burned to the ground. He'd been living in hiding ever since, taking odd jobs and keeping his head down due to his status as a traitor not only to his village, but to the empire as well. North, in Georgias, Edge and the dragon are buffeted by hurricane winds and attacks from pure-type autonomous bioweapons responding to their intruding presence. Fighting through to the eye of the storm, they descend to the water where automated repair drones work to restore something at the center of the hurricane. Destroying the drones halts the tornado and reveals the half-repaired wreckage of Shellkoof arisen from the water. Still dormant due to the halted repairs, Edge is able to scavenge what he can from the wreckage and leaves, his dragon too weak to access the rest of the ship. Edge brings back the pieces he's able to scavenge, but Pyatt isn't particularly impressed. Pyatt berates Edge, telling him to head back to Georgias and not come back unless he can find something spectacular. With no other leads on information about the tower, Edge can't do anything but head back, his tail between his legs. Not all is well on the return trip. Having left Shellkoof defenseless after deactivating its repair drones and intruder deterrence systems, Edge finds that the loading bay gate has been forcibly opened. Inside, he finds an entire Imperial squadron overseeing a dredging operation, which, to Edge's horror, has successfully pulled up the corpse of the Guardian Dragon Lundi and Loggy fought nearly 50 years prior. He's caught by guards while watching gliders move to study the creature and is knocked out after being surrounded. Tied to a chair and beaten fiercely, Edge is interrogated by Imperial officers who refuse to buy that they have a common enemy in Kraman. Assuming that Edge is on the Black Fleet's payroll, one of the officers claims that Kraman is a lunatic seeking the destructive powers of a tower in order to destroy the known world, and that things would be far safer with the towers under the Empire's control. The Imperial officers project the Empire's true intent onto Kraman, and it seems that Kraman's rebellion might be more deeply seated than just a power grab. As such, Edge refuses to give them any more information. They torture him, burning him until he passes out from the pain, impressed by his unwillingness to talk. Amongst his things, they find Pyatt's picture of the tower and surmise that Kraman must have already made his way there. Edge wakes up to see Gash crawling through the air vent, who quickly comes down and frees him from his restraints. On Gash's cue, an explosion in the distance sets off alarms, and when an officer comes to investigate Edge's cell, Gash takes him out efficiently. He's far more skilled than he seemed during their last meeting, trained in stealth and combat operations. He was here to investigate rumors that the Empire had come to dig up the means to end the now decades-long war. They escape through to the top deck, where Edge's dragon is waiting for them, implying that it was the dragon that found Gash and brought him to the fleet in order to orchestrate Edge's escape in the first place. Understanding the potential danger the creature poses under the Empire's control, 
Edge immediately attacks a ship towing the creature's corpse, attempting to bury it back under the waves for good. To their surprise, it reawakens and begins to fly. Gash then recalls information he read in ancient texts that stated the dragon-type creatures could, over time, return from the dead in order to pursue the completion of their genetically designed purpose, and that it's possible that Edge's dragon may have triggered this response in the creature. Thankfully, the Guardian Dragon is a far cry from the monster it was during Lundi's battle. Still ravaged by the damage Loggy wrought upon it, and sluggish from its years under the waves, Edge, Gash, and the adolescent dragon utterly destroy the creature, shredding it to pieces that fall beneath the clouds as Edge's dragon once again evolves. At camp, Gash and Edge catch up. Gash theorizes that Edge's remarkable toughness and quick recovery may be a result of his partnership with the dragon. Edge fills him in on what he learned of Kraman's plan, and Gash realizes the full extent of the conflict between the Black Fleet and the Empire. He's sure the Empire was seeking dragons for the purposes of war, and that the Guardian Dragon wasn't their only lead. Edge knew this already, though, and lets Gash in on the details of his battle with Atom and the mysterious woman above the Forbidden Zone. Just before wrapping up for the night, Edge laments that he forgot to finish his fetch quest for Pyatt. Gash laughs it off, giving him the parts he needs in exchange for a favor to cash in at a later date. Back in Zoa, Pyatt chides Edge for disappearing and Edge gives him the ship parts he asked for. Pyatt's utterly uninterested in them. It turns out Pyatt had been snooping on Edge and caught him with the dragon. Unable to hide his enthusiasm, Pyatt begs to see the dragon up close, emphasizing that he isn't a superstitious yokel like the rest of the villagers, but instead an open-minded scientist seeking the truth of the world buried under all the propaganda and religious belief. With the tables turned and Edge now holding the trump card, Pyatt gives him all the information he asked for. Endlessly fascinated with technology, Pyatt repaired an ancient machine that gave him control of camera drones in the region. It was using this tech that Pyatt was able to see the dragon and also take the picture of the tower safely. Too dangerous to approach from the sky due to the fog and monsters within it, Pyatt was investigating the ruins of a place called Uru in order to find a safer way to the tower. He shows Edge the footage, which is mostly just pretty aerial shots, until suddenly Atom and its rider swoop in and unknowingly knock the camera drone onto the surface of the lake. Pyatt reveals that he never intended to mislead anyone into thinking he'd actually been to the tower, and that really he just wanted to show off his cool tech. Unfortunately, with the camera drones damaged by Atom, the machine is basically useless now. Exiting the junkyard, Edge eavesdrops on Aldo and Abner talking about how they saw the Black Fleet flying for Uru. Digging for more intel, Edge ends up back at Juba's. Juba tells him that he was actually born in Uru, which was a massive settlement before the lake water rose and swallowed it completely. According to Juba, the ruins are far too dangerous to explore due to a combination of high rock walls and the presence of extremely territorial monsters. Upstairs, a seeker tries to sell some goods to a local trader who refuses to do business with someone who steals from the gods. Pursuing the lead, Edge stops back at the caravan. He overhears Anyo tell Enkak a story about Uru, one that alleges the real Uru is not the ruins of the town that had fallen beneath the waves, but rather a hidden complex somewhere deep within the rock wall. Enkak asks about dragons next, wondering if they're monsters, but Anyo says no. Anyo, like the Seekers, believes that dragons are the messengers of the gods sent to help humanity. Inside one of the tents, Raoul tells Edge that he witnessed an Imperial battleship heading eastward, corroborating the story told by Aldo and Abner in Zoa. Outside the tent, Anya requests that Edge not reveal Raoul's situation to anyone else lest it cause trouble. They only really hired him because he was the only mercenary they could afford, but he doesn't wish for any trouble to come about as a result of Raoul's previous association with the Empire. 
Located deep within the verdant region of Zoa to the west lies the submerged ruins of Uru. Without any human intervention since its fall, the area is home now to aggressive creatures and massive leviathan whales. Edge manages to rile up the local wildlife enough to open a path into a strange ancient bridge network adjoining different areas within the ruins. Responding to the dragon, ancient tech awakens in the area, that same voice from the transporter system in the Forbidden Zone announcing the process for deactivating the seals leading to some kind of facility from the ancient age. It also warns of a guardian unit called Drenholm that is connected to the seals and operating without its control protocols enabled. After spending most of the day going back and forth to poke around for keys, the sun begins to set. As twilight descends on the ruins, Edge finds that a black, flower-like structure has risen from the depths of the lake in response to his interaction with the seals. The Black Fleet takes this opportunity to attack while he's investigating a means to open the way into the structure. Clearly sent to defend the area, and warned of the possibility of a dragon encounter by the woman from the mine. With all the keys in place, the ruins were to life, with transmissions beaming from one seal to the next. The ancient technology begins to crumble as the guardian unit Drenholm begins to assemble. Edge sees Zestava watching from below and the two trade insults. Distracted by the opportunity for revenge, Edge and his dragon are knocked aside as Drenholm fully awakens and the two are forced to fight the suspiciously dragon-like sentry. Putting it all together, Edge realizes that the Black Fleet had a full understanding of his goals here, and attributes Drenholm's activation to their prior interference. Under cover of night, Edge and his dragon return to the ruin and confirm the final key, opening a passage to the tower as the Black Ruins begin to turn and power up. The vista around Edge begins to crack, revealing a tear in the air itself, as suddenly the sky shatters and Atom begins to attack. Atom, having evolved since the previous encounter, has a ton of new tricks. The dragons butt heads, and their psychic powers clash in the sky above the ruins. Atom's rider demands that he stop interfering with Kraman's plans. Suddenly, the opposing energy fields collapse in a violent explosion that send both Edge and the woman down into the strange portal opened above the ruins. Awakening deep within the facility separated from his dragon, Edge is helpless as he's surrounded by creatures. The woman's voice rings out, warning Edge that the creatures are blind, and saying that as long as he doesn't attack them, they won't notice his presence. Pinned under the rubble, she suggests a truce so that they may work together and escape. In exchange for answers, Edge accepts her proposal. She instructs Edge to activate the machine pinning her, a glider that she seems to understand how to pilot, and the two climb aboard to make their escape. To Edge's shock, she demonstrates a reliable understanding of the ancient facility and its technology, and they navigate the mutant-infested tunnels together. Having been dormant for so long, the creatures inside mutated enough to feed off of disparate energy sources, requiring them to be more careful about the type of attacks they use to eliminate them. The place is a massive labyrinth, and the floater they're using is low on power, unable to navigate back up tall ledges, which forces them to move forward and commit to their path. Deeper within, they find a ton of dragon corpses, and the woman reveals that this place was actually a genetics lab, and that these were failures. Simple prototypes terminated during the ancient age. She explains to a confused Edge that humans not only genetically engineered the dragons, but also programmed them with specific tasks in mind, confirming the information that Gash had read in his ancient texts. After hours of navigating the tunnels and opening gates, the woman informs Edge that she can feel their dragons waiting for them, resting until their return. Edge questions how she could know such a thing, and she suggests he may understand if he forms a closer bond with his dragon. Even though they're on opposite sides of the conflict, they connect over their similar circumstances as they're forced to work together without their dragons. Along the way, she also lets slip that Kraman's fleet had passed through these same tunnels on the way to the tower. Making it to the final elevator after a chase from a massive mutant, Edge and the woman enjoy their last bit of safety. 
she introduces herself as Azel, the Panzerese word for drone, which is inscribed on the stasis pod she slept in for thousands of years. She explains that despite looking like a human, she's actually closer to the monsters on a genetic level, and that the only major difference is her powers and their function. Edge doesn't understand why she opposes him, and questions her allegiance to Kraman, who she claims is trying to save the world. Edge is adamant in his belief that Kraman is a lying murderer, but this doesn't sway Azel, who's fiercely loyal to the commander. However, Edge was there before she awoke, and sets the record straight about what happened at the excavation site. She apologizes for his circumstances, which takes Edge by surprise. She admits human emotions are somewhat new to her. Changing the subject, she questions how he's able to ride the dragon, because they weren't designed to be controlled by normal people. But before he can respond, the elevator collapses. Unable to hold on, they fall, but just then Edge's dragon descends, catching Edge and Azel with its telekinetic powers and lifting them to its back to safety, where they can ascend and escape from the ruin. The creatures from the ruin chase them, and the dragon flees to the surface of the water. The two are forced to cooperate for one last battle together as they fight off their pursuers. Once the mutants go down, Edge's dragon evolves, and Azel feels Atom's call. Waiting on a nearby plateau for Atom to retrieve Azel, she coldly warns Edge that she will kill him if he doesn't stop interfering with Kraman's plan. She and Atom depart, leaving Edge and his dragon to ponder her threat. Making his way back to his campsite, Edge finds Pyatt waiting for him. Pyatt seems relieved to learn that the way to the tower has closed. While Edge was away, he spent some time looking into the dangerous fog obscuring the tower. In his research, he found that it's being created by a gigantic floating defense ship called Melkava, God's Carriage that it's linked to the tower. He wasn't able to find out much more, but tells Edge that there might be some information about Melkava archived somewhere in Zoa's holy district. Before Edge leaves, he begs to be given a ride on the dragon. Pyatt doesn't seem to fully understand the depth of the danger they're facing. In a way, he's not much different from the blindly faithful patrons of the holy district. But Edge denies him the chance, saying it would be far too dangerous due to how aggressive their enemies have become. At the nomad camp, Enkak has fallen ill with Mechania fever. Anyu has departed to seek a cure for his son, leaving only Raoul to protect the camp. Arriving at Zoa, Edge is forced to hide from Imperial agents departing from the Holy District who claim that the town is all but under their control without a means of defense against their fleet. Over at Juba's, the barkeep complains that the Empire's been scaring off his customers and that the only silver lining is that their impending takeover means lots of soldiers to fill the bar. He also offhandedly mentions that he heard the Tobitama, a rare type of bird, were seen returning to Uru. Now that he has his dragon again, Edge can return to Uru and fully investigate the facility he and Azel were trapped inside. Deep within the ruins, he's able to find ancient records that detail the development of dragon-type weaponry, shedding some light on the overall progression of the ancient age and its factional politics. Of special note is the development of a powerful dragon form known as the Lightwing, a being so powerful it's considered a messenger of the gods by those in the ancient age. Another record states that the drone designed for the project, Azel, was lost after an attack by an opposing faction. In order to prevent the Lightwing project from falling into the hands of their enemies, the Ancient Institute demanded the deletion of all data regarding the Lightwing. In an act of rebellion, the geneticists broke the Lightwing data into 12 D units, which have been deliberately lost with hope that a later generation may bring them together and continue their research. Back outside the ruins, investigating the Tobitama leads to Edge finding a Tobitama stone. When he takes it to the caravan to see if they'll buy it, it turns out it's the exact thing Baika needs to create a medicine that will save Enkak. He buys it off Edge immediately, saving Enkak's life in the process. 
When Edge returns to Zoa, Abner finds him in the courtyard and gives him a pass to enter the Holy District. A man named Vyman has summoned him. Abner assumes that Pyatt must have introduced them and that Edge bribed his way in, given that Vyman is Pyatt's father and the second-in-command to the High Priest of Zoa. Pissed that an outsider was granted access to the Holy District before him, Abner vows to quit his post as the Night Guard, clearly frustrated with the hypocrisy of the Zealots in the Inner District. He also lets Edge know that he doesn't have the cash to pay him back, but says that he can take whatever he wants from his house, leading Edge to a relic he found once, the second part of Lundy's journal. The Liberal District has markedly changed since the Empire arrived. Aldo is hiding in the basement of his home, hoping that he'll be able to wait out the Imperial occupation. Radgum is nowhere to be seen. Searching for him, Edge ends up back at the excavation site, where Radgum's lifeless corpse litters the ground, blood drained and back broken, his hand still wrapped tightly around his gun. Edge takes it, noting that Radgum died a warrior's death. The Holy District is distinctly different from the Liberal District. The architecture here is more beautiful and spacious, with little gardens and community areas where townsfolk can stroll through and admire the church's beautiful architecture. Inside the church, the high priest Daemon prays in front of a window made from glass derived from the colorful wings of monsters. Vyman's house is tucked in the far back, a huge estate with high walls in the terrace behind the church. This district is awash with color and beauty, strongly characterizing the devotion of the followers of Zoa. Two women sit and gossip by the front gate, intimidated by the presence of an outsider. Quitor, a merchant who had previously given Edge the cold shoulder in the liberal district, skulks around lamenting the economic downturn. He apologizes for his prior behavior, and even shares that Vyman had recently heralded the appearance of a dragon that will protect the town from the Empire's aggression. In front of Vyman's house, Edge can play hide-and-seek with a little girl named Rhoda, who wishes for friends her own age. The Holy District is a more serene place than the Liberal District, full of people simultaneously repressed by their religious doctrine and protected by it. Inside Vyman's estate, access to the second floor is blocked off entirely by junk in the stairwell. Pyatt argues with his father, shouting at him when he realizes that Vyman intends to leverage Edge's dragon for his own benefit. According to Pyatt, his father is a politician motivated only by his pursuit of power. Sick of the entire farce, he storms off. Vyman doesn't seem too bothered by this, and is quick to welcome Edge into his office to discuss his proposal. The Empire is in the frontier, and the Council is considering giving up the town to avoid their wrath. Vyman doesn't want to abdicate his position of power, though. He instead wants to use Edge and the Dragon to rally the townspeople against the Empire, uniting them. Knowing that Edge is seeking the Tower, he offers him access to the Council's information on the Ancient Age in exchange for Edge's cooperation. His plan is for Edge to assault the nearby Imperial base under the cover of night, a covert operation that will hopefully kneecap the Imperial military effort in the area. Edge agrees to the plan. Pyatt and Bezer are back in the junkyard working on the glider. Bezer chides Edge for accepting a job in the Holy District, dismissing him as being just like everyone else before going back to work on the machine. Pyatt isn't super pleased with Edge's choice to work with his father either, pondering his chances of survival before urging him to keep it on the sly, worrying that the townspeople might give him up to save themselves if they learn of the plan. Pyatt is pretty sure the Empire's actual goal in Zoa is to procure the Guardian Fire, which he thinks is vital to their research effort. He asks Edge to come by his room later that night to talk more. On his way, Edge lets Aldo know that Radgum died, which only strengthens Aldo's cowardice. Heading to the Holy District once night falls, Edge heads back to Vyman's estate, noticing a rope ladder hanging from a window on the second floor. Pyatt purposefully filled the room with so many books and so much technological scrap that it blocked off the stairs just to prevent his father from bothering him. He recognizes Aldo's gun, confused why Edge has it when Aldo had just asked him to do some upgrades. Clearly, they weren't enough to save the hunter's life. Pyatt's frustration is reaching its limit. 
He thinks the people of the town are blinded by faith and don't understand how dangerous the empire is. On the other hand, his father believes in the power of the dragon, but infuriatingly, he's only interested in it for his own gain. Pyatt's certain that under any other circumstances, his father would turn tail and abandon the people at the first opportunity. When asked why Pyatt hasn't left yet, he can't fully answer. A deep, hidden sense of hometown loyalty keeps him here. The outside world is dangerous, and the Guardian Fire keeps Zoa safe by repelling monsters, a function Pyatt is certain that the Empire is seeking to replicate. He's done a ton of research on the Ancient Age in an attempt to figure out why they vanished and how their tech worked. Among his collection of books, Edge finds the third and final part of Lundy's journal. At the bar, the seeker upstairs notices the pendant Gash gave Edge and introduces himself. Named Yefta, he's one of Gash's compatriots and a skilled spelunker in his own right. They chat for a bit, and he gives Edge a stolen Imperial Tower report before admiring Radgum's gun. The report details an Imperial scouting party's research as they investigated a tower off the northern coast 30 years prior. Originally dormant, the Empire attempted to awaken the tower for some time to no avail, until one day sightings of dragons fighting in the desert spurred it to life. The report details the events of the first Panzer Dragoon, as Kyle Fluga and Lagi pursued the prototype dragon to the tower and destroyed it amidst the collapse of the Imperial capital and the destruction of the vast majority of the Imperial fleet of the time. In the aftermath, the relatively unscathed Imperial Palace and Academy regrouped to begin working on heavier weaponry that might one day stand up to the dragons, culminating in the creation of the Imperial flagship Grig Orig. Once night has fallen, Edge and his dragon approach the Imperial base. Despite already being under a yellow alert, the base is completely unprepared for an attack from an enemy as swift as the dragon. It's an utter bloodbath as Edge and his dragon bring the full wrath of the Ancient Age down upon them, destroying the facilities and massacring the soldiers stationed there systematically as they make their way towards the inner wall. Periodic patrols encounter the dragon but are unable to do much other than scream in fear as they face annihilation. They refer to the dragon as a monster and it's hard to disagree with them. Edge's dragon is a weapon of the Ancient Age built to take life and end wars. Not even the Imperial Behemoth, a weapon designed specifically to take down dangerous targets, can stand against the arrows of light. Once it falls, the base goes on red alert, readying all of their weapons against the pair. Dropping the entire Enforcer fleet into the sea, Edge makes his way to Central Command and destroys the building. Realizing Vimin must be behind the attack, the remaining Imperials begin the launch process for the Deathmaker, a rail-accelerated bomber equipped with a warhead they intend to use to level Zoa in a final act of vengeance. It makes it into the sky, but Edge deftly shoots it down, dropping the warhead beneath the surface of the lake, ensuring Zoa's continued safety. The operation was a success the Empire deeply wounded by the horror wrought upon them by Edge and his dragon. By the time Edge makes it back to camp and the caravan, rumors are already spread to the nomads. Raul is sure that the dragon was responsible for the attack on the Imperial base. Baika attributes Edge's safety to the unseen dragon, completely unaware that Edge is its rider, and then thanks him for saving Nkak's life amidst all the chaos. Turns out his condition is stabilized, and everyone in the caravan is grateful. Back in Zoa, Edge runs into Pyatt, who's snooping on his father from outside the church. Inside, Damon is chastising Vimin for spreading rumors and inciting chaos in the town. The rest of the council has caught on to his machinations. Vimin fires back, claiming they're irresponsibly repeating the Empire's propaganda. The high priest here is caught by the difficult situation, forced to levy his faith against his common sense and responsibility for the safety of the believers in town. Vimin throws his faith back at him, claiming the town is protected by the gods, and most importantly, the dragon. Edge briefs them on the successful operation, much to Damon's frustration. With Vimin's political aspirations realized, it's likely the people of Zoa will choose him for the role of high priest at the next council election. 
Vyman dismisses Edge once they make it back to his home, as Quitor is waiting for him to discuss some local business. Pyatt's at the scrapyard, waiting to give Edge a letter he received from an unknown man who resembled a hunter. Doing as the letter says, Edge waits for nightfall at the junkyard and is surprised by Craman. Craman is equally befuddled by Edge's status as the Dragon Rider, and ponders on it for a moment before explaining that ruthlessness was the only option he had to obtain Azel, who he refers to as the key to his plan to save the world from extinction. The true purpose behind his visit to Zoa was to recruit Edge for his fight against the Empire. Pyatt turns on a searchlight overhead, disrupting the meeting and surprising them both, which summons Sestava, who peppers the area in bullet fire before swooping in on his glider to abscond with Kraman. Pyatt got a little ahead of himself, assuming Kraman was part of the Empire, and with him gone, Edge lost yet another opportunity for answers. The next morning, the villagers are in high spirits thanks to the council's proclamation that a dragon is protecting the town. Inside the shop, Jared recognizes and offers to buy Radgum's gun. He makes some small talk with Edge about the dragon and the council proclamation, as well as Edge's own quest for the tower. Seems like word is getting out despite Edge's attempts to lay low. Meeting with Vyman now that he's available, Edge receives a gift in the form of the key to the church's inner sanctuary where the guardian fire is kept. Vyman offers to keep Edge on retainer as the town's protector, an officially recognized position honored by the council, and Edge hesitantly agrees. As thanks, Vyman also lets Edge take from his personal library, and here he can find an Imperial Dragon report, likely the one that gave Vyman the information he needed to manipulate the beliefs of the locals and take advantage of their faith. Heading to the church sanctuary, Edge learns that the Guardian Fire is, in fact, a piece of ancient technology the church was built around. As he reaches to touch it, he collapses, his mind flooded with visions of a strange ship flying towards the tower, Melkava, the carriage of the gods that Pyatt mentioned a few nights prior. Right on cue, Pyatt rushes in and shakes him awake, finally able to get a glimpse of the Guardian Fire himself. He opts to stay here to study the machine and potentially unlock more of its secrets. He gives Edge a report on Melkava he assembled after all of his research, detailing the weapons and weak points of the ship. Pyatt's research is invaluable, his access to his father's restricted council archives and the ancient techie scrounges proving vital in Edge's continued pursuit of Kraman. The tower looms in the distance as Edge nears Melkava. Following Pyatt's plans, they infiltrate the ship and begin attacking it from the inside out. Melkava is huge, bigger than Shelkuf even, and its defenses are a mixture of sortied living weaponry and autonomous artillery. The fortress is powered by multiple large generators that disperse dangerous light particles. Each engine functions on its own, forcing Edge to move along the inner channel to disassemble the energy reactors one by one along the way. Melkava catastrophically explodes, dispersing the fog and clearing the sky. This draws the attention of Atolm and Azel, who immediately begin their attack. Edge pleads with her to stop to no avail. As the two dogfight, Edge seeks to disable Atolm without harming Azel. No match for the evolving dragon, Atolm falls beneath the clouds, taking Azel with him. Chasing after them, Edge's dragon uses its telekinesis to catch the incapacitated Azel. The two make for Zoa, and Edge stops as the Imperial flagship Gregorig appears in the distance. He's forced to watch in horror as the Empire readies its cannons, a massive beam of light tracing the ground as it slices through Zoa and leaves nothing but devastation in its wake. The lightning weapon Vyman mentioned was real, and all that remains of Zoa is ash and cinder. The town was obliterated in an instant, and the townsfolk died believing the dragon would protect them to no avail. At his campsite, Edge watches over the comatose Azul and wonders if he'll have to fight the Empire alone. Following a trail of particles to Shelkuf, Edge investigates the ship and is pulled inside by the current of light. The dragon, now much more powerful and evolved, is able to activate the ship, 
and within, a phantom image of Loggy manifests to guide him to the dragon crest within. As Edge and his dragon enter the Genesis Chamber, the crest reacts, a small baby dragon emerging from the cocoon. With the newfound dragon in tow, the group departs, finishing the job Loggy and Lundy started so long ago by destroying Shellkoof for good. With the threat of Grig Oreg on the horizon, Edge fights his way through the patrolling Imperial fleet. The soldiers are all taking their shots in an attempt to curry favor with the Emperor. Grig Oreg is a massive, multi-level floating fortress bigger than any weapon they've fought yet. Using the dragon's new abilities, Edge is able to shield himself from their artillery and take out the flagship's weapons one by one. Still, the ship is in top shape, with a well-oiled army working at peak effort to keep it operating at max power. They turn the laser cannon at Edge and blast the dragon, which somehow manages to survive the attack through the use of its telekinetic barrier. The land beneath them is scarred. They're causing more damage to the surroundings than they are to each other. Entering the fray, the Black Fleet descends to take advantage of the chaos. Sestava announces his arrival, stating that he was told to leave Edge alone and take out their common foe instead. Despite this, Zestava challenges Edge, believing Kraman's softness for him to be a fool's errand. He mocks Edge, stating that there's no running from the course of events that were started at the mine. Posing no real threat to Edge's dragon, the fight is over before it ever really begins. With the beautiful clear sky overhead, he looks back to Edge and congratulates him on avenging his friends. Today is a good day to die, he says, as he suicide bombs the Gregorig in a blaze of glory. Edge retreats as the Black Fleet continues their assault on the flagship. Azel's condition is deteriorating back at camp, and as Edge watches over her, he notices a strange letter that must have been delivered right after he left for Shelkoof. It's from Zastava, who knew he would die facing Edge. In it, he states that he knew Edge was a better warrior. He urges Edge to seek Kraman at the tower, believing the two of them together could truly save the world. The second part of the letter is written by Kraman himself. He thanks Edge for saving Azel twice, and asks that he bring her to the tower to help heal her, saying that she is a complex being, and that if Edge does not return her, she'll never regain consciousness. He tells Edge that the gateway will be opened for him, and signs the letter K.F. Kraman. Kyle Fluga Kraman, a young hunter who, 30 years prior, joined the Empire and climbed the ranks, seeking a means to finish a journey he started when an ancient drone telepathically implanted a mission deep in his mind. The dragons, the towers, the monsters, the mysteries of the ancient age. kraman has been hunting for answers, for closure, this entire time. A young hunter force-fed the truth of the world and left on his own after being cast aside. Edge enters the tower, the gateway opened just like Kraman said it would be. He instructs Edge to place Azel in an ancient stasis bed for recovery, and then sends a strange disk of light to carry Edge into the inner chamber. Here, within the tower, the bones of dragons and living weaponry hang suspended from the ceiling just like in the ruins of Uru. Descending further, Kraman awaits him in a room full of hologram screens. He's been watching everything unfold from here. He's disgusted by the Empire's appropriation of ancient technology, weapons with power so devastating they shouldn't be controlled by human hands. Kraman gives Edge a tour of the tower explaining that it's part of a network spanning the entire globe that protects humanity from itself. The monsters, the towers, the dragons, they were all created with a purpose. The truth is that they're autonomous ecological control systems, a terraforming mechanism that ensures the world can stay in balance, that humans can never take more than is given, that might one day heal the earth enough to sustain life again, no matter how dwindling that life is. Kraman believes that the Empire represents the worst of humanity's greed and self-destruction. 
wasting the planet's resources and killing each other for power. They would use the ancient age as technology to destroy and control. Crayman knew this and seized his opportunity to prevent it. Edge's impression of Crayman wasn't quite right. He wasn't just trying to mutiny and seize power for himself. Crayman is an eco-terrorist who believes that the Earth must be nurtured, that someone must power on the interwoven terraforming system of the towers and use it to heal the world, bringing peace, not war. Back with Azul, he explains that the ancient age fell due to mutually assured destruction between warring factions who disagreed on the implementation of the tower system. Azul was made to interface with the towers, to guide their hand. The Empire's excavation was meant to find her, to give the Emperor unlimited power over the planet. Crayman stopped that and gave her a new purpose, to save the world instead. Without being able to delay any longer, with Grigorig approaching on the horizon, Crayman turns to Edge and says that he's their only hope. It's here that Crayman steps back from his position as mastermind telling Edge that in truth, he has very little control over what will happen from here, that his job was merely to set the stage for Edge to make his decision as the Dragon Rider. Edge agrees to do what must be done, but warns Crayman that he hasn't forgiven him yet. The Empire's already flooded the tunnels around the tower, and Edge has to fight his way out to the flagship. The soldiers here readily give their life for the Emperor, zealots in their own right. Edge makes it to central control where Azel lies on the floor, awake. An ambush, the Emperor has Crayman at gunpoint and intends to capture Edge for experimentation, seeking to understand his power as the Dragon Rider. Crayman attempts to break free, using his hidden gun to shoot the Emperor to no avail. The Emperor sentences him to death, shooting him with the gun mounted on his floating throne. Azel is distraught, rushing to him as he bleeds out. As the Emperor claims his victory, the tower begins to awaken in response to Azel's pain, calling creatures from the ancient age down upon the Emperor and his forces. It's a massacre. Edge rushes to protect Azel as the creatures turn their focus to the pair. With the last of his life, Crayman gives Edge a knowing nod and is speared by one of the living weapons. Using the opportunity afforded to him by Crayman's sacrifice, Edge kills the creature and takes Azel to his dragon, fleeing as the creatures begin to gather and defend the tower just like they did when Crayman rode Loggy to war against the prototype dragon. Meeting up with Raoul at the Nomad Caravan, Edge learns that a Seeker is waiting for him. Yefta made it out of Zoa before the Empire destroyed the town, and he was sent by Gash to retrieve Edge. He gives Edge a map to the Seeker's stronghold, saying Gash is waiting for his arrival. Taking Azel with him, Edge enters the stronghold and meets up with Gash, who offers to use his resources to help Azel recover. Miraculously, Pyatt's waiting inside having fled from Zoa on his glider right before the Grigorig could fire its laser. He was taken in by the Seekers after his glider crashed not long after takeoff. Gash shows Edge around the stronghold, receiving reports from the surrounding Seekers as they walk. It's clear Gash occupies a position of great power here, and Edge begins to realize that as mysterious as Gash and the Seekers are, it's clear they keep even more secrets than he realized. Gash reveals that he's their leader, a position he holds partially due to his short stature and physical disabilities. A cunning man, he's used the cover these seeming weaknesses provided him to protect himself and the people around him. By underestimating him, their enemies have overlooked them, unaware that he's been pulling their strings and manipulating them all in their own shadow war the whole time. Cashing in the favors that Edge owes him, Gash tells Edge that the Seekers have been researching the Ancient Age for nearly 200 years, and that they've had their eye on Edge ever since they learned he had access to the dragon. He intends to use Edge to destroy the tower and free humanity from the oppressive control it represents, vowing to reclaim the world for humanity and reshape it against the will of the Ancients. 
This naturally upsets Edge, who has just learned his last ally has been manipulating him and grooming him for war this entire time. Kraman wanted to use the towers to save the world, but the Seekers will throw that opportunity away altogether to seek a higher level of freedom and autonomy. It's an idealistic fight, but it's one that risks everything Kraman and Azul had fought for up to this point. The Seekers have concluded that the Divine Visitor of Ages Past must have been the dragon itself, attributing the fall of the Ancient Age to the creature. Gash believes Azul can lead the dragon to the tower and destroy it using their combined power. Once again, Edge is given a choice he can't refuse. Without their help, Azul may never awaken, and as Astava said, there's no running from what started back at the excavation site. The Seekers are scholarly and scrappy people, their hideout decorated with beautiful tapestries and textiles. They seem tight-knit, united in their pursuit of knowledge and the danger of covert and nomadic life. Azul sleeps in their medical bay, cared for by a nurse who seems skilled with ancient technology and chemistry. Contrary to the Empire's claims, the Seekers are far more advanced than mere tomb raiders. Down in a storage area where Pyatt's glider is being kept, Edge is berated by Bezer, who had also escaped unharmed. Bezer shames him for not doing more to protect Zoa. The boys dreamt his whole life of leaving the town's protective walls, but now that it's been taken away, he finds himself with nothing left but fury towards the people that stole his home. Up on the second floor, Edge wanders into a shop and is shocked to find Jared, the new shopkeeper from Zoa. He was just spying on the town, as hinted by his access to banned literature, dragon rider journals, and his capability with ancient technology. Edge also encounters Zadok, the stronghold's archivist. Zadok spent his life as a compiler, researching the ancient age and its lore. This granted him a position of great honor among the rest of the Seekers. Zadok's reports explain the function of the towers and the status of the ancient's terraforming project. The towers are connected through a central intelligence network called Sestren, a sort of trans-dimensional plane where information exists in its purest form beyond time and space. The towers are something like an access point for Sestren, and they're used to interface with the planet directly. The term for them in Panzeries is Azul Sestren, Servants of Sestren. From this we learn Azul's true identity, not just that of a key or a drone, but a living tower a being meant to personify them and directly communicate with Sestrin itself. The Seekers believe that by using a tower, it is possible to open a gate to Sestrin, and that by traversing it and destroying Sestrin at the source, they have a chance of disconnecting the network entirely and deactivating the towers for good. Zadok gives him the final journal of the person they believed was the last true dragon rider, the man that was Gash's master a mysterious seeker named Skiad Ops Endo. In truth, this is Jean-Jacques Lundy. After Logi implanted the vision of the future in his mind at the end of Zvi, Lundy traveled the frontier seeking the truth of the towers. It was then that he encountered the seekers and helped them on their mission to understand the ancient age. He learned much over the course of his adult life, diving into ruins and studying tablets and ancient data to discover the truth of the fall of the ancient age. It was Lundi who discovered the nature of the terraforming program and the truth about the monsters that cull humanity in order to preserve the health of the planet. Back in ancient times, rebels rose in response to the terraforming plan. The ancients created more and more weaponry, including the dragons, to protect their creations. They were programmed to guard the towers. The dragons and monsters awaken whenever they sense a threat to their bound home. With no hope of standing up against the dragons with conventional weaponry, the dissident faction needed a dragon of their own. A small tweak in the genetic programming algorithm that would fly under the radar. A single dragon would be born. The Heresy Dragon. One that sought not to protect the system, but destroy it entirely. This was the result of the attack mentioned in the Lightwing data back in the ruins of Uru. And it's here that it all comes together. Lundi posits that the towers, through their terraforming and genetic seeding of the land, continuously birthed the Heresy Dragon as a mutation in the Kulia stock, 
that people over time came to kill the mutant Kulia in fear of the response an awakened tower would bring once the heresy dragon matured. It's exactly what was wrought upon his home in the village of Elpis nearly 50 years prior. Lundi believes that Edge's dragon is yet another manifestation of the heresy mutation. In a way, the very soul of Lagi reincarnated once more after entering Sestrin through the Dragon Crest portal in Shelkuf, the Tower of the Sky. It's up to Edge to see this thousand year journey through to the end, a relay race across time and space to free the world from the shadow of the ancient age. Zadok shares his wealth of knowledge freely. The Seekers believe Sestrin is the only way they could reasonably destroy the towers, as taking them all out manually would take hundreds, maybe thousands of years. Azul could open the path to allow the dragon to enter and poison the network from the inside. Zadok calls Sestrin a network of astral passages, and seems to believe that Azul and the dragon may be able to navigate them given the proper conditions. The Seeker's understanding of monsters and the tower network is what allowed them to survive as long as they have. Their nomadic lifestyle originating from their predictions and awareness of the tower's targeting and migration patterns. Sadok also reveals that the Empire as we know it today originated with the Seekers rather than by a divine bloodline going back to the ancient age as they claim. With no divine mandate, as the imperial propaganda would state, the Empire formed from a faction of Seekers obsessed with ancient technology and power, which explains why the Empire sought to control information about the Seekers so actively. Given much to consider, Edge returns to the Med Bay to check on Azul. Gash is waiting for him as Azul jolts awake. Edge wonders if she was having a bad dream, but she's confused, having never experienced a dream before. Wanting Azul to understand her part in all of this, Gash harshly blames her for Kraman's death, stating that it was she who awoke the monsters that killed him in an embodiment of the tower's brutal cycle of life. News of the Empire's advance reaches Edge and Gash, and Azul requests to be left alone to think. Before he can depart, she finally asks Edge's name. Giving it to her, he leaves to prepare for the upcoming battle. Gash watches as the tower's monsters overtake the Grigorig, sending the flagship's defense systems into overdrive. Under heavy fire as the ship destroys everything in its path, Edge departs to make for the Imperial Fortress. Near the entrance, Azul speaks with a Seeker child, bonding with them over their lost father figures. When asked where she was born, Azul says that she's thousands of years old, but has little memory of the ancient age. Edge checks in on her, but she tries to reassure him as he leaves. He doesn't need to worry about her, as she doesn't need food or water to survive, and the Seeker's hideout is safe, and no one wishes her any harm. Monsters swarm the Gregorig above the forest of Zoa. Fires rage in the underbrush, and mutant creatures reach from the forest floor towards the ships overhead. The Grig Orig is fully infested by the time Edge catches up with it. Parasites and creatures having taken over the excavated technology the Imperial military requisitioned for use in its construction. It's practically alive, a wild beast thrashing in pain. Monsters feed it energy to supplement its power, uniting against the dragon to charge the lightning cannon in a last stand against its arrows of light. Upon its destruction, the dragon evolves once more. On his way back to the Seeker's stronghold, Edge stops by the caravan to check on the nomads. They've made it to the fields of Zoa, finally, and are preparing to set down roots. Enkak is doing much better. He's over the moon about a glider Anyo found on his hunt. According to Ko, the glider's owner was a young boy found dead at the site of the crash. Of course, this is Bezer, having stolen Pyatt's glider from the Seeker stronghold, unable to repair it enough to sustain long-term flight. The nomads have found peace amidst the chaos, standing as a testament to Gash's hope that humans may be able to find a path forward by their own hand. Azul is nowhere to be found once Edge makes it back to the stronghold. Gash takes responsibility, blaming his absence and lack of security for her escape. They tracked her northward, but lost her trace due to weather conditions. Edge figures she left to delay the return to the tower, still struggling to process Kraman's death. Edge departs to search for Azul, returning to various locations from his journey. Retracing his footsteps, Edge finds more of the scattered D units from the ancient age, and uncovers a strange ruin deep within the forest of Zoa that seems to be dormant. Still, 
no sign of Azel. Seeking to return to her place of birth, Azel found her way deep within the ruins of Uru, to the genetic laboratory where the failed prototypes and Lightwing research was made. Recovering her, the two return to camp and Azel apologizes for worrying Edge. She confesses guilt over her creation as part of the tower system, believing Sestrin and the towers were designed to enslave the world. Her role was to control the tower, and the weight of that destiny is bearing down upon her. Despite this, she knows little of the true nature of Sestrin. Edge comforts her, expressing his condolences about Kraemin, which confuses her. The nuance of Edge's evolving feelings towards his prior enemy gives her pause. Kraemin was just another body atop a pile of corpses this conflict has generated, and his death solved nothing. The two head back for the Seeker stronghold. When they arrive, the Seekers are preparing their dead for funeral rites. Gathering the survivors around the fire, Gash laments that they don't have the forces to fight back anymore, but believes the Seekers, who've survived for hundreds of years now, may live to fight another day. His duty as the Shadow Eye is to his people, and despite having lost the battle, he does not believe they've lost the war. To their surprise, Edge intends to return to the tower. The dragon wishes to go there. There's more to it, though. Strategically, this will lure the monsters away from the frontier and give the Seekers a safe escape route. Azel agrees to guide Edge to the tower, both because it's her duty but because she also wants to see Kraemin's plan through to the end and find the truth of her destiny for herself. Gash vows to wait for them in the valley outside of Kynos once the battle is over. Making for the tower, the pair find that it's largely unguarded. The tower's in some kind of automatic lockdown state, awaiting orders. The security system active, but operating without specific direction. Edge asks Azel to promise him that, should anything happen to him, she'll take the dragon and return to Gash. She refuses, saying it's impossible. Edge and the dragon are intrinsically linked, just like she and Atolm were. If Edge were to die, the dragon would lose its purpose. Whatever happens is destined to occur, no matter the outcome. Nonetheless, she believes in Edge. The deeper they explore into the tower, the more her understanding flourishes as her connection to the network increases in strength. Edge finds the final D unit, and suddenly the dragon evolves into the Lightwing, a beautiful weapon of mass destruction. The pair can go no further without activating the tower and committing to their attack on Sestrin, and so they leave for one last tour of the surface. Edge and Azel return to the excavation site and look over the place where their journey started, reflecting on everything that's happened thus far. Called back to the ruins within the forest of Zoa by a mysterious urge, the Lightwing is able to awaken the ruins and interact with the dragon crests within. The child dragon that had been following them since Shelkuf suddenly begins to sparkle and glow, merging with the Lightwing, fusing with it. Reunited soul and body after decades of waiting, winged death is reborn. Lagi, the solo wing. Returning to the tower and descending into the lower levels, the defense systems are far more active, and living weapons lurk around every junction. As they near the bottom of the tower, Azel warns Edge that she's not sure what lies at the heart of the Sestrin network, nor if Edge will be able to return. Edge refuses to turn back, and the two vow to see this through of their own free will. Azel, for the first time in her life, feels like she's finally had the chance to determine her own fate. She thanks Edge for his companionship, and the two descend to the Sestrin gate. Azel enters a stasis pod, interfacing the tower as lights beam and connect at her will. Opening the gate, Azel stays behind to control the tower and ensure its destruction in a twofold attack to take out Sestrin and protect the Seekers. Expressing her love for Edge and her desire to no longer be alone, Edge pleads for her to wait for him as he enters the gate and the tower blossoms, emitting a massive, dimension-warping beam into the sky transmitting Edge into the astral passages of the Sestrin network. Mm -hmm. 
Sestrin is a psychedelic void, the same one seen at the beginning of the game during name entry. Astral aspects of the dragon swarm Loggy and Edge, and the pair are forced to take them out one by one as they navigate the warping mindscape of this strange plane. One by one, they tame the dragon forms, navigating an endless sea deeper toward the heart of the network. There, Edge demands that Sestrin show itself. It arrives in the form of a dragon and chastises Loggy for disobeying the will of the ancients. Recognizing the heresy dragon has brought the divine visitor with it, Sestrin begins its attack. Motes of light swirl around the creature, and attacking them causes memories to manifest ahead of them, all tied to Loggy in his quest as the heresy dragon, with Sestrin pulling the strings along the way in an attempt to stop him. Everything has led to this, a journey set in stone and foretold in this strange place beyond time. Fate has already determined the outcome, and Sestrin was guaranteed to fail. The Heresy Dragon wins, as it always would. Taking control of Sestrin, Loggy speaks to Edge. It is up to the Divine Visitor to destroy the merged Heresy program, to take out Sestrin at its core while Loggy has control of it. Edge is baffled. Edge assumed, like the Seekers, that Loggy was the Divine Visitor, but this has never been the case. The dragon existed to shepherd the Divine Visitor along the journey to Sestrin, to give them a chance to break free of the Ancient Age and give humanity agency in this world of prophecy and fate. The Divine Visitor was none other than the player, who entered their name into Sestrin's record at the start of the game, who entered Edge's body after his death at the mine, and controlled him this entire time. The player was borrowing Edge's body to interact with and perceive this strange foreign world. The heresy program tells the player to push the button, the literal controller in their hands, and welcome an end and a new beginning. When the Divine Visitor pushes the button, Loggy tells Edge that they must go, and Edge turns to face the camera. Recognizing the player through the screen as the light flickers off, and the TV cuts to black. Far across the desert near the village of Kynus, Gash can wait no longer for Edge to return to meet them. They're speaking Panzerese now, the dialogue no longer translated to us through Edge's perspective. An unknown amount of time later, a woman travels west through the desert. Asking for directions, a nomad warns her of the dangers, stating the person she's looking for isn't worth risking her life. Not understanding why someone from Zoa, who survived the war, would risk their life this way, he offers to let her stay with them as they travel, but she declines. Making for the desert, Azel continues her quest to find Edge, staying true to her vow that she would no longer let herself be alone in this world. Free from the yoke of the towers and the ecological control system left behind by the ancients, humanity forges a path forward with only themselves to answer to. Nothing ever ends. Not really, at least. In the wake of the destruction of the towers in Gregorig, humans are left to fight over what is left of the planet, finally freed mostly from the pure-type weaponry that culled them if they wandered too far. Remnants from the Imperial Academy, the research institute left behind in the ruins of the capital during the Great Fall, continued the traditions of their fallen empire, waiting for an heir to claim the throne. One would come from across the Southern Sea, and was raised as a symbol for the people left behind. In the decades that followed, the new empire would unite disparate peoples across the land, protecting them from the ecologically unstable and dangerous world that the Divine Visitor released upon them when the tower system was destroyed. Humanity's freedom from the ancients came at the great cost of oppression by their own hand. Using the technology and records extracted from their encounters with the dragon during the years leading up to and including the Great Fall, scientists from the Imperial Academy worked to create proxy weapons that mimicked the power of the dragons. Like 
Known as dragon mares, these bioengineered creatures fuse the Empire's understanding of mutant biology with their study of ancient technology, giving them all but total control over the weakened populace. But life outside the Empire would sustain, as it always did. Seekers and nomads would form tribes in this new world, forging new ways of life as the Empire toiled behind the scenes to control what was left of society. One night, the Empire launches an attack on a seeker settlement within the Yellico Valley. Overseeing the operation is Latral Naus Demilkol, one of the scientists responsible for the Dragon Mare program. Berated by his weak and sickly son for leaving to prioritize work and warfare, Latral urges his son to take his medicine and go to bed. Dispatched to obtain important research materials, the military attacks a large tower, and inside they find their target, a silver-haired woman kept in chains high above the rest of the valley. The woman, known as Orta, lived her whole life here in captivity, secreted away from the rest of the world. The dragon mares siege the tower and surround Orta, but a sudden burst of light takes them out as a familiar face appears. Green, with strong white plating and two horns upon his head, the heresy dragon returns to rescue Orta in her time of need. The form Lagi takes this time is highly evolved and dangerous, able to switch forms at will, much like Edge's incarnation of the Heresy Dragon, though with a much higher degree of agility. Orta fends off the attackers, escaping from the village through a waterway, making their way up to the sky, an Imperial airship readies for attack. The military has been waiting for this opportunity for decades now, having sought the power of a true dragon for some time. Like all the Imperial ships that stood against the dragon before, they plummet from the sky and wreckage crashes into the village below. Orta doesn't understand why this creature came for her, but there's little time to worry. Suddenly, they're surrounded by an elite dragon mare unit led by Captain Evren. They mock her, but are suddenly dispatched by an interloper. A strange, decrepit drone named Avad appears and assaults their dragon mares. Evren accuses him of mutiny, of betraying the Empire before retreating. Avad seems to know Orta, speaking to her directly. He'd been searching for her. He claims to have foreseen her destiny, saying she is key to saving this doomed world from itself. Orta and her dragon follow him out of the valley. Evren and the Mare Squadron return to base and brief the Empire on the return of the Dragon of Destruction, redoubling their mission to capture Orta and complete their operation at a location known as the Cradle, where they seemingly are engineering the Dragon Mares. In the Imperial Capital, Eva Demokal, son of Latral, is notified of his father's death. Left with nothing but an amulet, Eva curses the irony that his father was a killer who ended up only getting himself killed. Knowing he wouldn't last a day on his own, he joins the Imperial Academy and undergoes military training. Despite his poor health, he continues taking the supply of medicine his father left for him and manages to pass through basic. With only about 50 days worth of meds remaining, his time for revenge dwindles with each day spent at the Academy. Despite growing up a loner, rarely ever allowed to leave the house, he makes a friend in Strate Uramis, an ace pilot among his class at the academy. The kindness breaks Eva, who cries in front of his new friend. His feelings about his father are conflicted, having spent his whole life wishing he would die for his pursuit of warfare and work. Eva feels guilty about what happened to him. Strate comforts him, urging him to blame the dragon for his father's death. A creature he claims is not only real, but the very thing they're training to defeat. Orta loses Avad's trail along the riverbed of a verdant forest. Here, a group of tribal people fly makeshift chariots led by domesticated flying worms and hunt local mutated wildlife for food. The nomadic tribes have adapted, just as much as they've stayed the same over these long years, and they carve a small but proud life out for themselves here in the New World. 
Orda helps them as they attempt to take down a massive centipede, but when a second appears, they disperse, forcing Orda to take them both down on her own in a tight forest passage she lured them into. Outside, Orda regroups with the tribesmen who are led by a boy named Mobo, who requests that she help them take down a strange plant-like being that glides across the water. Once the threat has cooled down and they get a closer look at her ride, they mistake her for an agent of the Empire flying a dragon mare. Believing they've been tricked, they curse her and fly off. Deep inside an ancient ruin, Avad attempts to initiate a resuscitation program to no avail. Avad laments the inability for him to bring his old masters back, the tower system still damaged from the Divine Visitor's attack on Sestrin. Pursuing the so-called Winged Death, the Military Academy recovers from its massive losses and prepares Strate's unit for a mission. Eva hears a rumor that their goal is to capture the Dragon of Destruction, and he sneaks aboard Strate's ship in order to get his revenge. Amused by his antics and impressed by his bravery, Strate gives him control of the ship, allowing him his chance at glory. Tracking a group of tribesmen across a gray desert waste, they skirmish as they make their way towards Orta. Having fended off the nomads, spirits are high among the Imperial child soldiers until suddenly, radio static bursts across their communication lines and fear erupts amongst them. One by one, they go down, taken out by the dragon's lasers. Eva's friends screaming in pain and fear as Orta kills them. Amidst the chaos, the tribesmen reappear and launch an attack on Orta, believing her to be part of the squadron. After swatting them away, Mobo realizes his mistake, the differences in her combat style from the Empire making it clear. Mobo introduces himself, apologizing for his rash behavior, and offers to lead Orta across the waste. It's not safe here in the ruins of an old, ancient city, its defense system still creaking to life to fight off intruders. The two fight their way through the ruins, taking cover underneath ancient structures and collaborating to kill off dilapidated but nonetheless dangerous weaponry. Mobo guides Orda to their destination, a village on the back of a massive Latham, living amongst the forest and greenery growing on its back. A perfect hiding place for the tribe, the tribe leader suggests Orda stay with them for a while to rest. He can feel her loneliness, her hate for the world. She lashes out at him. For Orda, life has been nothing but sadness. The world called her the harbinger of destruction. It imprisoned her and deprived her of love, family, or friends. But these people don't care about that. They offer her a place amongst them and warmly welcome her to their home, a place without chains. On the ground, a seeker caravan scavenges for technology in the wreckage of Strate's unit. Finding Eva, they rescue him, the only survivor of the attack. A woman named Emid nurses him back to health against the better judgment of her peers. Damod, their leader, suggests a test. If the boy can use a floater pod to obtain water for them, he'll be allowed to stay and carry his own weight. The seekers have changed over the years but their unified belief in community service and loyalty remains as strong as ever. Passing the test, Eva is welcomed into their den. They're kind and share their food and celebrate Eva's victory. Repairing his pod so he can better contribute to the commune, they teach him the seeker way. In the time since the attack, the Empire tracks the dragon to its hiding place on the back of the Latham and launches a siege on the Worm Rider village. Orda and Mobo take to the sky to defend the settlement. Orda is fierce in her defense of the Warm Riders, the only people who ever showed her any kindness. The fleet is massive, outnumbering anything they'd ever seen before. It proves too much for Mobo, who's shot from the sky by a beam weapon mounted atop the flagship as Orda watches in horror. Furious, she tears a hole through their forces, burrowing into the ship as she works her way to the top deck. Inside, hundreds of dormant dragon mares sleep, ready for battle. Above, a tall, autonomous weapon identifies her as a drone and readies its defenses. A sick amalgamation of imperial ingenuity and ancient technology, Orda destroys the weapon ahead of the mare squadron's arrival. Horrified by the information that she too is a drone like Avad, Orda curses her birth, wondering if she is just a weapon meant for destruction. Evren appears and mocks her again, 
claiming drones only bring death and destruction before vowing to tear her apart. The Dragonmare Squadron is extremely dangerous and capable, flying in hard-to-hit patterns and confusing rhythms. Evren is a fearsome enemy, clearly experienced in dogfighting and dragon-based combat. Despite this, Dragonmares are mockeries of true dragons, and recognizing her defeat, Evren self-destructs, catching Orda and her dragon in the explosion and sending them tumbling to the snowfields below. Awakening alone, Orda wanders in the snow until she finds the dragon, rushing to his side to comfort him. He awakens at her touch, wounded but alive, his horns and shell plate cracking under the stress of combat. He is her protector, and linked by this bond, she can feel its pain and pride as it rises again to guide her to safety. Over the next few days, Emid meets with Eva and shares the stories of her people with him. These particular nomads were survivors from the Yellico Valley. Emid tells him the truth of the attack that night, that the Empire had attacked the city unprompted using the new Dragonmare army. Eva is aghast, finally learning that his father was responsible for the creation of the Dragonmares. Like Gash before her, Emid struggles to reconcile the serenity of the Ancient Age with the legacy of destruction it left behind. The Seekers now work to make the world habitable, having fulfilled their mission of destroying the towers. She teaches Eva about their technology and about their findings in the ruins of the Yellico Valley. She speaks of a strange ancient weapon found inside the ruins, a kind of drum, she believes, that might have been a large bomb or detonator of some kind. Eva and Emmet are interrupted by Noof, who lets them know that the dragon and its rider have been spotted in the snowfields. Unable to let sleeping dogs lie, Eva rushes off to his glider in pursuit of Orda. Orda's dragon carries her on foot, unable to fly with shredded wings. The snowfields are dangerous and full of massive creatures. Unable to take to the air, the pair is forced to defend themselves from a much more precarious position on the ground. Crossing the icy plains, they make their way to a massive stone bridge crossing a gigantic lake. As if responding to the dragon, a beautiful and deadly creature arises, launching spines at the pair. The creature rams the bridge, cutting off their path, but the dragon barrels ahead off the edge, and just as it would fall, its wings regenerate allowing it to take to the sky once more. With newfound strength, they fight off the creature as the dragon finally overtakes it. Looking back, Orda realizes it was merely a mother protecting its children. They give it space with the intent to let it live, but far above, a Vod makes his attack, killing the creature and its spawn. He mocks Orda, questioning her inability to kill. He's undergoing some kind of degradation, and his sanity is slipping. He tells her that he needs her, and guides her forward. Eva arrives as Borda crosses the snowy landscape to follow Avad. Vowing to take her down, he dodges enemies and stays on her tail despite the meager strength of his pod's failing engine. Just as he catches up to her, she turns and looks at him, ready to fire. To his surprise, she stays her hand and leaves him behind. Eva recognized the loneliness in her eyes, and feeling a sudden kinship, was unable to pull the trigger. He returns to the Seeker den, dejected and confused. Before he's able to dismount his glider, he has a seizure, and Emmett is forced to give him the last of his medicine. With nothing left, he looks at an amulet his father gave him, and Emmett recognizes it. It's not a necklace. It's a letter container. The letter details his father's true reason for joining the Imperial military and advancing Dragonmare research. When Eva was a child, he drank from a poisoned well that compromised his immune system. Seeking a cure, Latral experimented on various mutated creatures and sought to mimic their advanced regenerative capabilities. It worked for some time, but Eva's virus kept adapting, changing in response to the treatment. With nowhere else to turn, he brought his research to the Empire, who put him to work on the Dragonmare program. The Dragonmares, like dragons, were powerfully regenerative. It was from this research on the Dragonmares that Eva's new medicine was developed, capable of suppressing the virus and keeping its symptoms at bay, adapting to the adaptations it made, and evolving on its own. In the letter, Latral apologizes for pursuing warfare and work, admitting that Eva was right 
that he never wanted any of this, and that his sole motivation was to find a way to have more time with his son. He urges Eva to find a cure, to seek a way to live in the world without him. Just then, they're attacked by Imperial Dragon Mares. Attempting to draw them away, Eva readies his glider and departs for the Yellico Valley, hoping to draw them into the radius of the ancient weapon Emmett told him about before he left to chase Orda in the snowfield. Avad and Orda reach a dilapidated ruin in an overgrown caldera. Inside, Avad descends into the tunnels, leaving Orda to fight off the defense systems that identify her as an intruder. Despite needing her for his goals, Avad doesn't seem concerned about her safety, perhaps due to the strength he senses within her. Avad says that this is where she was created, and the dragon screeches in response. The tower detects an unauthorized molecular structure and attempts to purge the intruders, but they make it deeper inside, catching up with Avad, who explains that unlike true life, drones are slaves that aren't meant to spread their genes or have free will. That in their entire history, only one was ever able to break from these limitations. Avad guides Orda to a terminal that contains a record of the world, and thus the truth of her birth. Following deeper inside, it recognizes her genome and welcomes her as the system administrator. A protocol activates, and Orda is transported into the astral passages of Sestrin. The system, confused by Orda's presence, responds with great hostility in an attempt to prevent her exploration of the data landscape. It shows her strange memories, snippets of audio speaking about the creation of a special drone, one that might change the future. She's shown strange psychic echoes of important events, of Shelkuf flying over Georgius before finally making it to the Sestrin core, where a strange program speaks to her with a familiar voice. Her mother left a message deep within the system in the hope that it would one day reach her. She'd searched for a long time, unable to fully grasp the purpose of a world where so much suffering could exist. And yet, she still found the strength to walk her path, pursuing her own free will. Despite not finding what she sought, she had Orda. Entering Sestrin, Azel combined her and Edge's genetic template and birthed a new type of drone in hope that it might change the world. Orda was the promise of a new future, the product of the only drone who ever broke free from its destiny, and a man who defied fate to break the world free from history's cruel design. She tells Orda that no matter what, Azel and Edge exist within her, and that she is never truly alone. Avad attacks Orda, seeking to take her body and use its genetic template to resuscitate the drone program and fulfill the will of the ancients once again. Seeking to inherit the world and return to achieve its purpose, Avad has degraded over time, and here, within Sestrin, his prime directive is corrupting. Through the network, he travels to the Cradle, a massive dragon mare cloning facility powered by ancient technology. It was through a partnership with Avad that the Empire was able to leverage this technology and create their army of dragon mares. They failed to realize that by making these records accessible, they were giving Avad exactly what he needed to reconfigure the tower network that Azel and Edge had disconnected during the Great Fall. In the Yellico Valley, Eva encounters an Imperial unit that he identifies as his class from the military academy. They welcome him, shocked that he survived. They refuse the order to shoot him down, rebelling against the Imperial Decree. Descending into the ruins, Eva makes his way to the superweapon Emid told him about. It's a huge drum meant to be activated with an ancient mallet. Swinging the weapon and preparing for death, the drum resounds and releases a beautiful pulse of light. But it's not death that overtakes Eva. Instead, a sound echoes and rings out, awakening the guardian fire deep within. These ruins were not a weapon, but a beacon much like the one in the village of Zoa transmitting a signal that was able to repel monsters. The dragon mares and bioengineered creatures flee the valley. 
Orda ejects herself from the astral passages of Sestrin, appearing in the Imperial capital to take down their military facilities. Through their partnership with Avad, they've greatly enhanced their technological capability, repurposing whole tunnels and ancient systems for use in their ships. Orda destroys an entire squadron of dormant sleeping dragon mares, bursting through tunnels and chasing gliders as she whips through the hangars and cloning bays. Chaos breaks out as the army fails to fend off the dragon, spreading confusion and fear through the Imperial ranks. They ready a massive mech, claiming that drones are no longer necessary for their plan, that they can create dragons on their own. This makes no difference to Orda as she destroys their weaponry, intent on protecting the world and forging the future her mother dreamed of. Fully activated now, the cradle rises into the sky, and around it, Sestrin bleeds into the world, warping space in the sky. The dragon mares begin to frenzy in response to Avad's call. But Orda is no longer alone. Mobo appears, having survived the battle with the fleet, and he's brought the United Worm Rider tribes with him to assist her assault. While they take down the fleet, Orda battles the remaining dragon mare squadron. Releasing a berserk volley of light arrows, the cradle's core is exposed. The remaining dragon mares surround Orda, but the cradle itself pulls them in, amassing them and forming a new core. Avad's new body gestates within a spiked geometric shell as he decries the filth he woke into and demands that he and Orda arise to rule the world. Reality breaks as Sestrin bleeds and blurs the line between dimensions. Avad is still evolving, prematurely brought into this world, but deadly and wild with chaos and rage. Unable to damage the core before he's able to evolve, Avad becomes a massive guardian dragon not unlike the creature Lundi and Kraemon fought in the past. An ultimate weapon born of a deranged drone, Orda and her dragon push Avad to his limit, killing him and returning him to Sestrin as the boundary between worlds recedes once again. With the battle over, Orda's dragon falls weak, landing on the remnants of the cradle. It collapses, unable to hold her, its purpose finally fulfilled, and its body free to die. She begs for it to open its eyes, to awaken again to no response. Back in the Yellico Valley, Eva and Emid sit on a rock and ponder the future beneath this beautiful rainbow sky. Eva revels in the majesty of a world equally dangerous and serene as he closes his eyes for one last time. And so the legend ends, and with it, a new beginning. Meeting the morning in a grassy plain, Orda walks alongside a small, winged dragon pup, proof of the dragon's legacy, ready to finally walk its own path. I cannot get over how ambitious and interesting these games are, and how often they refuse to take the easy way out narratively. I love how the three dragon riders of the Saturn saga are put on perpendicular, conflicting paths as a result of their connection to the dragon, and I love how none of the conclusions are completely happy endings. There are few things I can say are as simultaneously hopeful and somber as Panzer Dragoon, a series so fundamentally my jam that I'm stuck shrugging when people ask me to describe a frame of reference for the series that isn't purely tautological. Sure, it's easy to point to the series' influences like I did earlier in this video when trying to give people an idea of what to expect, but what actually is delivered by the end of this series is so different from anything else from the time that really the only way to fully grok these games is to play them. That's part of the problem here, too. With the first three titles stuck on the Saturn, requiring hardware-intensive emulation to get a good experience, 
it's hard to onboard people into this series. That's part of why I wanted to make this video in the first place, to give people a means of experiencing them and sort of work out this feeling I've had since I first played them that not enough people have seen these games or have any idea of all the cool things that they do. For those who do want to take the emulation route, I highly suggest running the games in Mednafen's RetroArch core, Beetle Saturn. It'll require some decent hardware, but you can get a good experience out of it without too much tinkering. Saturn emulation has historically been pretty difficult, but ever since the emulation scene exploded in 2016 when the Saturn's hardware DRM was cracked, things have gotten a lot easier. These games have lingered in the back of my mind since the week I played through them in a binge back during the swelteringly hot North Seattle summer of 2017. There are so many little details that just have their hooks in me. I call my attention back during moments when I let my mind wander too far from the task at hand. I love the way the weird blue-green translucent water looks in the fourth level of Zvi and the rippling of the bridge as you run from the fish monster while it pursues you. I love the strange, bone-like look of all of the ancient technology and how simultaneously alien and goofy it makes objects appear. The guns in these games look so weird in a way that the people don't. Play-Doh-like in their early 3D modeling, yet ominous and strange at the same time. It's hard to imagine the actual mechanics of how they function. They're fundamentally uncool, weird, and unwieldy, but in a way that adds to their strange import as weapons of devastating power. So too is the uniquely Japanese tribal nomad aesthetic to settlements and clothing in the series. I don't know if it's rooted in Ainu influence or what, but the particular fantasy nomad look depicted in the games crops up in a few other Japanese works. Things like Utawarerumono and Dot Hack, and I'm always a huge fan of it. Layered textiles, lots of patterned markings and face paint. It's a kind of anime aesthetic that I miss that was deeply popular in the early 2000s and not often seen anymore. The music too has that certain dot hack je ne sais quoi. The final battle theme of Zvi is just so good. I love this weirdly arranged version from one of the OST releases. It just tickles me the way that the horns come in and just sound so odd. I also just really love the Nomad theme from Saga. There's something homey about it, like you're just sitting around a campfire and I don't know, so few game OSTs really match the aesthetic of their game in such a perfect and synchronous way. All I'm trying to say here is that these games leave an imprint on the people who play them in a really, really big way. It's a flavor you can't get anywhere else. Panzer Dragoon has inspired a fervent fan following over the years, with tons of great content made about the series. The fan site Panzer Dragoon Legacy stands as a testament to the fan base of this game and its long lasting appeal. Without its resources, this video would not have been possible. There have been a ton of articles written about the games in the past few years as people look back on the legacy of the Saturn as a whole. A bibliography will be included in the description for those looking for direct links. There are also a ton of great retrospectives on the series, its lore, and the technology behind the games. Michael Saba put out a fantastic video on Saga as a lost masterpiece. I Finished a Game has an absolutely stellar retrospective on the entire series much more documentarian than this video was. Retro Mule has a fantastic deep dive on Saga specifically, and DF Retro has a wonderful breakdown of the technology pushing the first and second game. 
I highly recommend checking these videos out if you want more Panzer Dragoon content after this video. Panzer Dragoon hasn't received as much attention on the modern video sharing internet as some other hidden gems out there, but a quick search on YouTube will get you a decent amount of essays, playthroughs, and reviews to fill your time with more Panzer Dragoon if you're looking for it. Perhaps the most relevant impact of Panzer Dragoon's ongoing legacy is the attention it's received in the form of Forever Entertainment SA's recent remake of the first game. Announced during the E3 2019 Nintendo Direct, the Panzer Dragoon remake was eventually released multi-platform. It's a pretty decent remake of the first game, it makes some changes to the art direction as you'd expect, but it's true to the original where it counts, and Azuma Yoshitaka's amazing score is rearranged and orchestrated by Kobayashi Saori. Players looking for a full overhaul from the original might feel like the remake is a little bit devoid of content, but I think that's part of what makes it so promising. Forever Entertainment SA is currently working on a remake of Zvi, and their adherence to the original and the restraint they displayed with the first remake bodes well for their next releases. Here's hoping we eventually get a re-release of Saga, so that more people can eventually play these games on more platforms not locked to emulation or expensive physical copies that sooner or later will succumb to disc rot. Much like the world that Panzer Dragoon depicts, destruction and beauty come hand in hand. Majesty can be hard to find even as it surrounds us, and it takes effort and determination to walk our paths and find our way to the things that matter. Panzer Dragoon matters, even if it wasn't fully appreciated when it would have made the most impact for the folks at Team Andromeda back in the day. My experience with Panzer Dragoon was always one in close passing. As a child, I grew up with lots of consoles. My dad worked with computers and was always a bit of a technophile, and my extended family was pretty nerdy and involved in the entertainment industry, so we always had access to cool new tech. My mother especially has always loved video games. Her favorite game of all time is Resident Evil 4, if that's any indication. I literally just got her the remake for Christmas this year. Hats off to her for being a real one. Still, I was never really allowed to touch her Saturn growing up, so while I never played the games as a kid, I do remember going to my uncle's house, a comic book artist by trade, and finding his copy of Saga in a box of electronics in the garage. Seeing the Saturn logo on the case and being overwhelmed with this sensation that I'd broken some sort of unspoken taboo, I remember leaving it there, that fragile plastic coffin precariously perched on the edge of the stacking shelves next to boxes of old comic floppies and a Truxton cart left to collect dust. Ugh, if only I knew how much that game was worth, I would have stolen it. Could have saved myself a hut grand 20 years later. I think that's part of the allure, though. The legend, the sights in passing. Lots of people have heard of Panzer Dragoon, but I know so few who have actually played the series, least of all the Saturn entries. That's a big shame. Not only is there a lot of cool narrative and art in there, but also a lot of history, the sweat and tears of a team that was too forward-thinking, too uncompromising in their vision. The very essence of what made Sega so… Sega. I think Panzer Dragoon's status as a title people have heard of but have never played is quintessential to its modern identity. It's the or example of a game series spoken of in passing but never intimately. Its praise is sung but only secondhand. It's a rare piece of gaming history encountered only by a destined few, bestowed upon us by a once great creative team now lost to time. Panzer Dragoon is many things to many people. The hope for an end to war. A new beginning forged in the fires of conflict. The promise of a savior, of divine intervention in the face of annihilation. A child of destiny, the last remnant of a future that never came to be. A lingering dream of forgotten history.
Boy, that was a long one, huh? <laughs> I learned a lot during the process of making this video and writing this script, so I think the next ones should happen a little bit more quickly. Figuring out the format and making all the assets took a huge amount of time. Shout out to Knackle and Cough for their help on that front. And that was before we even got to the story summary portion of this video, which just took way too long to make. I don't know if I'm going to cover a full series quite like this again in the near future. It was an insane task for a first video, and I truly cannot believe that I did it. <laughs> I'm very proud of what I've made, but it's been a whirlwind, and it took a little bit longer than I wanted to get out. That being said, I'm really happy to share this with all of you now. Projects like this take a lot of time and energy, and it's tough to balance that with my day job on top of daily streaming and maintaining content across all of my associated channels and projects. Work of this magnitude could not have been done without the support and guidance of my patrons on Patreon and my subscribers on YouTube and Twitch. If you want to support me, you can do so over at patreon.com slash toasted ringtail and get access to behind the scenes updates and early access to scripts and test renders. We also have a great Discord community where subscribers can submit game suggestions, ask me questions that I answer at the end of these video reviews, and chat with me in general. We're cultivating a fun vibe over there, so feel free to check out the link in the description if you want to give it a look. Over on my Twitch channel, we play stuff almost every day, usually between the hours of 6pm PST and 10pm PST, with some wiggle room. YouTube VOD uploads are way behind the Twitch streams, so if you want to catch what I'm up to, that's a great place to do it, and it really helps me out. In 2023, we streamed nearly 70 games to completion, so there's always something new on the schedule to check out. If you want to give me a follow over there, you can do so at twitch.tv slash toasted ringtail. Alright, so these next questions are submitted into my community Discord. If you want to go ahead and join that Discord, you can in the link below. Uh, so without further ado, let's answer some community questions. Ruben asks, what was the first game you played that you can remember? Have you played it since then? Uh, the first game that I ever played was Quake. Uh, I played it in 1995 on a Windows 95 PC, and I have played it tons of times since then. It is one of my favorite boomer shooters, uh, very gothic and Lovecraftian. Uh, it's pretty cool. I'm a big fan of Quake. Jipple asks, what game do you find to be the most nostalgic for you? Uh, this one's pretty simple. I'm going to keep my answer for it relatively light because I will probably end up making content about this game at some point. Uh, the game that I find the most nostalgic is easily, without a doubt, Castlevania 64. Uh, that game has just an immaculate vibe and I loved it as a child. Um, I think it's without a doubt, it and Legacy of Darkness are without a doubt the, the best 3D Castlevanias, so. Sage asks, what is a piece of art or media that you love which you couldn't recommend to any normal person? <laughs> uh, my answer to this uh, comes straight to top of mind. Uh, it's Everywhere at the End of Time by The Caretaker. Uh, if you have never heard of this before, uh, fair warning, it's pretty grim. Uh, it is a series of concept albums, kind of one big concept album that sonically tries to emulate the experience of slowly having your memories degraded as if you were experiencing dementia or Alzheimer's. Uh, this is not music you would listen to for fun. This is a series of albums that are exceptionally weird and, and one of a kind, and it's the kind of avant-garde art that I think is like really important and genuinely influential and innovative. Um, but yeah, if you don't have the stomach for existential horror, um, probably don't listen to it because it is extremely disturbing and uh, it, it truly is uncomfortable to listen to. But uh, if you do like crazy, interesting art, I highly recommend giving that a listen. Uh, it is a very interesting experience. Aegis Lord asks, where did the name Toaster come from? Uh, the answer to this is super simple. Uh, I worked near a gigantic silver building in Seattle at one point. Uh, it was a WeWork office owned by Amazon, 
and the building was named Toaster. Sheepish Justice asks, what are your top three most revisited music albums? This is super easy for me to answer. Uh, the very first one is probably Polygon Dwana Land by King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. Number two is probably Nonagon Infinity by King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. And number three is probably Sunset Mission by Boren and Der Club of Gore. Hats off to you if you made it this far into this monster of a video. If you liked it, feel free to hit the like button and leave a comment. If you leave a question, I might answer it at the end of the next video. If you want to see that next video, hit subscribe. Also, make sure to show this to anyone who might be interested in this format. It really helps. I hope you had as much fun as I did staying up late to check out Panzer Dragoon. I've been Toaster. See you next time. Special thanks to Zek for Beans, Ka, Literally Marty, Alistair, Kettle Chips, It's a Secret, Gwyn, Lucas Johnson, Gibble Schnurk, Eden Brescia, Joe C, Your Local Auto, Cole Girders, Rod Anderson, Sugi, Willem Ott, Narik, Splinter OOS, Reed Worm, Hoofy Hoof, Tempest, Robin Tear, Incognito Mode, Haley CT, Soul, Hexacult, Levi Core, Christian Svensson, Novica, Thoth, Ryan Norris, Slim Pup, Typo Coon, Aegis Lord, Dreams of Ice, Rude My Dude, A Gamer and Stuff.